Tom and Eileen, Lone Again. In January 1998, husband and wife Tom and Eileen were returning from a Peace Corps mission in Fiji, heading home to Hawaii. Both were experienced divers and decided they couldn't pass up the chance of diving at the Great Barrier Reef. So on January 25th, they boarded the outer edge boat that took them and a group of other tourists 40 miles out to sea, where they visited three dive sites, the last being a place named Fish City. The pair were experienced divers and were comfortable going off on their own in the water. However, when they resurfaced from their dive, to their horror, their dive boat had departed without them, leaving them all alone bobbing in the vast ocean. It is standard practice for dive excursion to do a head count before heading back to shore, but on this occasion, something went drastically wrong. None of the vessel's crew or passengers noticed the two had not come back aboard, until two days later, when the boat owner looked in a bag that had been left behind that day by a passenger. Immediately, alarm bells started to ring when he discovered Tom's wallet. A rescue team was immediately sent out and extensive searches were made, but sadly, the couple were never seen again. Their bodies assumed to be lost at sea. Like other nightmarish experiences, Tom and Eileen's story was turned into a film called Open Water that depicted the couple meeting their end, circled by sharks. But the true story is much scarier, simply because no one really knows what happened to them. Over the years, a lot of information has come out about their lives and the circumstances that led to them being abandoned. Several weeks after they were reported missing, pieces of their diving gear washed up on shore, including inflatable jackets with their names on, air tanks, and a woman's wetsuit. However, none of the items had any signs of blood or holes that would be consistent with a shark attack. What was strange was why the Lonergans had removed the jacket that would help to keep them afloat. It's theorized they may have taken them off in an attempt to swim to shore, although without the buoyancy of their jackets, they would have likely worn themselves out to the point of exhaustion. One of the most chilling things was discovered six months after they disappeared, when a dive slate was discovered by a fisherman. A dive slate is used by divers so they can communicate underwater. They are basically small boards where information and messages can be written. The dive slate found by the fisherman was dated January 26th, 1998, with a time of 8 a.m. and a message that read, please help us or we will die. The distress note appears to indicate the loner gangs were still alive, at least until the next day. Also discovered at the couple's home were diaries that both Tom and Eileen had kept, and some of the entries indicated all was not well in their lives. They wrote about hating their jobs, and eerily, Eileen felt her husband had developed a death wish. Tom's diary appeared to back this up, with an entry that read, Like a student who has finished an exam, I feel that my life is complete and I am ready to die. These revelations led to suggestions. The couple were either carrying out a suicide pact or were the victims of a murder-suicide at the hands of Tom. Another strange theory emerged while police were investigating the case. The captain of another boat claimed to have visited the same dive spot the next day and may have encountered the couple. According to his story, the head count before the vessel's return trip came out two more than the one taken when the boat left port. Apparently, the tourists on the boat were all from Italy and spoke in their native tongue. However, the captain remembers hearing a few American voices among the tourists that day. If this account is true, it could indicate the Lonergans planned to spend the night in the ocean, knowing they could join another dive boat the next day, leading to claims the Lona Gangs faked their own death. This theory was later reinforced when more than 20 people came forward, claiming to have seen the Lonergans after they supposedly disappeared. However, considering they both left their passports behind, never touched their bank accounts after the incident, and their insurance policies were never cashed in, this does seem a bit far-fetched. Some have questioned why the Lonergans didn't swim to one of the well-lit diving platforms a few miles away or flag down a passing ship, although it's been pointed out that although these things would be easily visible from the deck of a boat, they may not have been easily seen from the surface of the water. Tom had also left his glasses on board, making it even more difficult for him to see. In addition, it's highly likely the Lonergans were in a state of panic. They had been left completely alone, and as hours ticked by, they must have realized their boat wasn't returning for them, and there was no active rescue underway. Coupled this with the heat from the sun and lack of fresh drinking water, they were likely in a bad way. No one knows what happened to the Lonergangs. 
and it's hard to imagine being in that situation, totally alone surrounded by a shark infested ocean. It seems unlikely that they were eaten by sharks, as though half of the world's sharks live in the waters around Australia, most of them are completely harmless to humans. All the evidence seems to point to the Lunar Gangs becoming exhausted and drowning. Clearly mistakes were made by the boat owner, and after he was acquitted of manslaughter, a civil case was brought against him and the business closed. Stricter laws on how dive companies operate and how headcounts are taken have also been enforced. It's horrific to think they likely lived for at least 48 hours alone in the ocean. The case is sad because unless they intentionally faked their own death, which seems unlikely, this shouldn't have happened. Ron and Dan Lafferty Ron and Dan Lafferty were raised in a large dysfunctional family in Orem, Utah. Ron was the eldest of eight children that consisted of six boys and two girls. They were all brought up in a strict Mormon family and their father was a stern disciplinarian who sometimes took out his rage on the family. On one occasion, he beat the family dog to death with a baseball bat. As well as being a disciplinarian, he was also a conspiracy theorist who taught his children to distrust conventional medicine and the federal government. As Ron and Dan grew up, they became very close and both carried their father's extreme beliefs into adulthood. Dan in particular thought he was well above the law and was often in trouble for refusing to pay taxes or obey traffic laws. Both men married and continued to be active members of the church. However, eventually Dan became disgruntled with the Mormon church when it abandoned polygamy the practice of taking more than one wife, and he joined a splinter group called the School of the Prophets. Ron soon followed his younger brother into the movement after being excommunicated from the Mormon church in 1983. The School of the Prophets taught how to receive relations from God, and soon all six Lafferty brothers joined the movement, and all of them were spending a lot of time together, railing against the Mormon church and the US government, much to the annoyance of their wives. Dan and Ron also declared to the group that they were prophets and both men started sporting an unkept appearance with long beards. Eventually, Ron's wife left him. She objected to his bizarre and twisted views and refused to practice polygamy. Ron was bereft and deeply depressed after she left and spent his days and nights writing what he believed would one day be a scripture. But his anguish at the breakup of his marriage soon turned into rage and he blamed three people Chloe Lowe, a former Mormon Relief Society president who had supported his wife during the divorce, Richard Stowe, the Highland Mormon stake president who had presided over his excommunication, and Brenda Wright Lafferty, the strong-willed wife of his youngest brother, Alan. Brenda was a former beauty queen and a college graduate. She was confident and not afraid to speak up. She didn't believe Ron or Dan were prophets, and she told them as much. She also objected to their fundamentalist belief in polygamy, and when Alan started to be influenced by Dan and Ron's beliefs, she fought back and stopped him attending the meetings. Ron's anger towards Brenda grew in his mind. She had driven away his wife and now she was splitting up the brothers. He later claimed he had a revelation that God told him that Brenda needed to be removed along with her infant daughter. Ron shared his revelation with the School of Prophets members on what he called the removal revelation list. Chloe Lowe and Richard Stowe were also on it. This is what he wrote. Thus saint the Lord, unto my servants the prophets, it is my will and commandment that ye remove the following individuals in order that my work might go forward. For they have truly become obstacles in my path and I will not allow my work to be stopped. First thy brother's wife Brenda and her baby, then Chloe Lowe and then Richard Stowe. And it is my will that they be removed in rapid succession. On the afternoon of July 24th, 1984, Ron and his brother Dan set out to fulfill the revelation. Driving a battered green station wagon, they drove to Alan and Brenda's home in American Fork, Utah, carrying with them guns and knives. The two bearded men entered the house where they beat and strangled Brenda with a vacuum cleaner cord before slashing her and baby Erica's throat with a knife. Both men were soon arrested for the crime. In court, Dan represented himself and was found guilty and sentenced to five years to life. 
After psychiatric evaluation, Ron was found to be fit to stand trial and was also tried and convicted in 1985. He was sentenced to death. After years of unsuccessful appealing on grounds of mental capability, Ron elected to be executed by firing squad. However, in 2019, Ron died in Salt Lake City State Prison, age 78. Had he lived, he was due to be executed the following year. His brother Dan still languishes in the maximum security wing of Utah State Prison, and over the years has spoken in graphic detail about what he did to his sister-in-law and baby niece. A book called Under the Banner of Heaven, A Story of Violent Faith was written about the brothers based on interviews Dan gave. Dan remains to this day unrepentant, still believing all organized religion is of the devil. He doesn't believe he will die in prison. He believes the walls will crumble and he will emerge as the biblical prophet Elijah, announcing the second coming of Christ. The Nepropetrovsk Maniacs. This case was suggested by one of our patrons. It was committed in Ukraine by three friends who went on a three-week killing spree during which they killed over 20 innocent people. Viktor Seyenko, Igor Sopranyuk, and Alexander Hanza were all born in 1988 to wealthy influential parents and attended school together in Nepropetrovsk, Ukraine. They all suffered from various phobias, which they tried to overcome by doing strange activities, such as hanging over the railing of balconies to combat their fear of height, and torturing and killing stray dogs and cats to cure a fear of blood. After leaving school, Sayenko and Hansa got jobs, while Sopranyuk became an unlicensed taxi driver. To make extra money, the three teenagers started robbing taxi passengers. However, eventually, Sayenko and Sopranyuk lost interest in robbing and decided to move on to murders. In a three-week killing spree between June and July 2007, they randomly selected victims who happened to be out walking. After creeping up on their victims, they mercilessly bludgeoned them to death with blunt instruments, such as hammers and steel bars. They often killed more than one person in a day, beating them so badly that they would be almost unrecognizable. Some of the victims were also tortured and mutilated. They then recorded and photographed their dead victims, posing with them as if they had been out hunting. They were eventually caught after a survivor, 14-year-old Vadmin Lyakov, ran to the police after his friend was murdered by the pair. Initially, Vadmin was blamed for the killing, however, it quickly became clear that he was not responsible, and his sketches of the perpetrators helped to identify them. The three 19-year-olds were charged with involvement in 29 separate incidents, including 21 murders, and eight more attacks where victims survived. Sopranyuk was charged with 27 of the cases, including 21 counts of capital murder, eight armed robberies, and one count of animal cruelty. Sienko was also charged with 25 instances, including 18 murders, five robberies, and one count of animal cruelty, and Hansa was charged with two counts of armed robbery, as he never participated in any of the murders. Sopranyuk and Sienko were both sentenced to life imprisonment, while Hansa was sentenced to nine years. No motive has ever been established, although local media reported the killers had a plan to get rich from showing the murders on the internet. In April 2019, it was reported that Alexander Hansa had been released from prison after serving nine years and is now married and living with his wife and two children somewhere in Ukraine. The Devastating Story of John Edward Jones At age 26, John Edward Jones was in the prime of his life. He was married, he had a one-year-old daughter and was attending medical school in Virginia. In November 2009, John had traveled back to his hometown in Utah to spend with his friends and family. John and his brother Josh had been keen cavers as kids, along with nine other friends and family members, and decided to explore Nutty Putty Cave, a notoriously tricky hydrothermal cave formation located just west of Utah Lake. The group set off on the evening of November the 24th. About an hour into the expedition, John decided to find the Nutty Putty Cave Formation, known as the Birth Canal, a very tight passage that experienced Splunkers needed to carefully crawl through. It had been years since John had been in a cave, and at six feet tall and 200 pounds, he wasn't the little kid who used to easily crawl into caves with his father. 
Despite this, John pushed on, entering the narrow opening head first, carefully shuffling along using his hips, stomach and fingers. However, it soon became apparent he was stuck. He had squeezed in so tightly, he had no room to turn around and no room to back out. He tried to push on, but just made things worse. He was stuck in a space that was barely 10 inches across and 18 inches high. Josh was the first to find John and tried to pull his brother out by grabbing his legs. However, this made things worse as John slid down into the passage even further and his arms were now pinned underneath his chest and he couldn't move at all. All the brothers who were devout Mormons could do at this point was pray. Josh called for help, but because John was trapped 400 feet into the cave and 100 feet below the surface, getting rescuers equipment and supplies down that far took over an hour. The first rescuer to reach John was a woman named Susie Motola who arrived just after midnight on November 25th. By this time, John had been stuck for three and a half hours. All Susie could see was a pair of navy and black running shoes. Time was running out for John. The downward angle at which he was trapped was putting huge stress on his body and his blood was struggling to pump around and he was having some difficulty breathing. At one point, rescuers brought a two-way cable radio into the cave and managed to lower it to John so he could speak with his wife. They were both understandably upset, but able to comfort each other. Over the next 24 hours, more than 100 rescue workers tried to free John, but after everything failed to budge him, they decided to use a system of pulleys and ropes. They tied John to a rope connected to a series of pulleys. When everything was in place, they pulled as hard as they could, working in an eight-man tandem. John was at times in great pain, but slowly but surely he started to move, until he was finally high enough to make eye contact with one of the rescuers. They even managed a short conversation. John was almost out. Then suddenly, without warning, one of the pulleys failed after coming loose from its anchor point in the cave wall. The entire team fell backwards as the rope suddenly went loose. Once the dust had settled, the rescuers realized John had slid right down the crevice again, this time seemingly even deeper than before. There was now no hope of rescue, and John's heart could take no more after hours of strain due to his downward position. Sadly, John was pronounced dead of cardiac arrest shortly before midnight on the evening of November 25th, 2009. Rescuers had heroically spent 27 hours trying to save him. His family thanked them for their help, even despite the tragic news. After John's death, officials sealed off Nutty Putty K for good. They never recovered his body, which remains inside to this day. John's family had a plaque put on the entrance of the cave in his memory, and Nutty Putty Cave now serves as a national memorial and gravesite to John Edward Jones. In 2016, filmmaker Isaac Halasima produced and directed a full-length feature film about the life and failed rescue of John Jones called The Last Descent. It gives an accurate and terrifying insight into the ordeal John suffered. Anatoly Moskvin Anatoly Moskvin was a smart guy. He spoke 13 languages, traveled extensively, and was a published scholar and college lecturer. He also had a dubious reputation as being an expert on cemeteries, as he knew everything there was to know about the cemeteries in his city, Nizhdi Novgorod, Russia. Moskvin claimed that between 2005 and 2007, he visited 752 cemeteries and delved into their histories of those buried there. He attributed his obsession with the macabre to a 1979 incident when he was 13 and a group of men in black suits stopped him on the way home from school. They were en route to the funeral of 11-year-old Natasha Petrova and allegedly dragged young Moskvin to her coffin where they forced him to kiss the girl's corpse. Moskvin even claimed he spent one night sleeping in a coffin ahead of a deceased person's funeral to add to his observations. However, it seems at one point, this obsession with death spilled over. In 2009, locals began to discover the graves of their loved ones desecrated or completely dug up. Initially, authorities thought it was done by some extremist organizations, so they increased police units in the affected areas. But after nearly two years, they found nothing, and graves continued to be desecrated. They then got a break following a terrorist attack at a Moscow airport in 2011. Shortly afterwards, Muslim graves in the area started being vandalized. Someone was painting over the pictures of dead Muslims. 
Further investigations led them to Moskvin, who was caught red-handed at the graves. Police later searched his home, a small apartment he shared with his parents, and what they found was shocking. The apartment was full of life-sized, doll-like figures. The figures resembled antique dolls, they were dressed in fine clothing, and some wore knee-high boots and had makeup on their cloth-covered faces. Except these were not dolls, they were mummified corpses of human girls. Take a look at this footage, but be warned, it is disturbing. Inside the chest of many of the dolls, Moskvin had weirdly embedded music boxes, so when he lifted them up, they played music. Investigators also found photographs and plaques taken from gravestones, as well as doll-making manuals and maps of local cemeteries. There were also personal belongings and clothing inside some of the mummies, and one had a piece of her own gravestone with her name scrawled on it inside her body. Another one contained a hospital tag with the date and the cause of her death, and a dried human heart was found inside a third body. Moskvin later admitted that he would stuff the decaying corpses with rags and wrap their hands in nylon tights and draw faces on them. He would also insert buttons or fake eyes into the girls' eye sockets so that they could watch cartoons with him. He told police that he dug up graves of girls because he was lonely and wanted children of his own. After taking them home, he used a simple solution of salt and baking soda to preserve the corpses. He treated them as if they were his daughters by singing to them and celebrating their birthdays. Moskvin also said he was waiting for science to find a way to bring the girls back to life. He always denied any sexual attraction to the dolls. In all, authorities discovered 29 life-size dolls in his apartment. They ranged in age from three to 25, and one corpse had been kept for nearly nine years. Remarkably, his parents claimed to know nothing of the true origin of the dolls living in their home, believing it was just a hobby of their sons. Moskvin was charged with a dozen crimes, all of which dealt with the desecration of graves. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia and sentenced to time in a psychiatric hospital. Chillingly, Moskvin allegedly told authorities not to bother reburying the girls too deeply, as he will simply unbury them when he is released. Hawk Terrier was born on May 16, 1947, in Quebec, Canada. He was a highly intelligent child, but dropped out of school at an early age to study and learn the Old Testament of the Bible. He later converted from Catholicism to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Hawk was very charismatic and was good at influencing people, and eventually he convinced an entire group of like-minded people to quit their jobs and form a religious sect he called the Ant Hill Kids named for their ant-like hard work. Terrio was their self-proclaimed prophet, who went by the name Moise. By 1977, Terrio and his followers had formed a commune that was free of sin and stood for equality and unity. They were a doomsday cult whose beliefs were based on the Seventh-day Adventist church. The group made their living by selling baked goods. However, Terrio had developed a drink problem and his behavior became increasingly erratic and abusive. Followers had to abide by extreme rules, which included no contact with their families and no speaking to each other unless he was present. As his drinking got worse, Terrio started punishing his followers in more extreme ways if he thought they didn't appear devoted enough to him or if any of them wished to leave. These punishments included beatings with belts or hammers, hanging them from the ceiling, plucking hairs from their bodies, and defecating on them. Harriot also convinced his followers that the world would end in 1979 and instructed the whole commune to relocate into the Canadian wilderness to a mountainside he called Eternal Mountain, 
in San Jorge, where he claimed they could all be saved. But when 1979 came and went, he told his followers that time on earth and in God's world was not parallel, and that therefore he'd made a miscalculation. Despite Terry Alt's increasingly cruel and abusive behavior, he still had absolute devotion from his followers, and he took multiple wives and partners, telling them that impregnating all female members was a religious requirement. Eventually, he fathered 26 children. In 1984, the group's 40 members relocated to a site near Burnt River, Ontario. By this time, Terry Alt's punishments were becoming more and more extreme, to the point he made members break their own legs with sledgehammers, sit on lit stoves, shoot each other in the shoulders, and eat dead mice, insects, and feces. Sometimes he would ask a follower to prove their loyalty by cutting off another member's toes with wire cutters. His children also suffered horrific abuse. They were sexually abused, howled over fires, and nailed to trees, while other children threw stones at them. Things got so bad that one of Terriel's wives left her newborn child, Elisa Lavalie, outside to die in freezing temperatures to keep him away from the abuse. He also started performing unnecessary surgical operations on sick members to demonstrate his healing powers. These surgeries included injecting a 94% ethanol solution into stomachs or performing circumcisions on children and adults without anesthetic. In 1987, authorities were informed of some of the practices at the commune and removed 17 of the children. However, remarkably, Terriel faced no action for his abusive acts. Things would only get worse in 1989 when follower Solange Boylard complained of an upset stomach. Terriel decided to perform another surgery without anesthesia. He laid Solange naked on a table and punched her in the stomach. Then he performed a crude enema with molasses and olive oil before cutting open her stomach and ripping out parts of her intestines with his bare hands. Terriel made another member, Gabrielle Lavely, stitch her up using a needle and thread and got another woman to shove a tube down her throat and blow in it. Unsurprisingly, Solange died the next day but Terriel claimed that he had a power of resuscitation and drilled a hole into Solange's skull. Then he had other members, along with himself, ejaculate into the cavity. When Solange did not return to life, her body was buried a short distance from the commune. Gabrielle, who assisted in the operation, had finally had enough. She had endured her own pain. After having blowtorches held to her genitals, eight of her teeth taken out, and a hypodermic needle breaking off in her spine, so she escaped, but for unknown reasons, she returned shortly after, because she could not live without the cult. When she returned, Terriel punished her by cutting off one of her fingers, nailing her hand to a table, and amputating her entire arm. Later, he cut off parts of her breasts and smashed her head in with an axe. After the mutilation, Gabrielle finally fled and alerted the authorities. In 1989, Terriel was arrested for assault and was found guilty for the amputation of Gabrielle's arm. He received a 12-year prison sentence. During his incarceration, he fathered four more children during conjugal visits with female cult members who remained devoted to him. However, further investigations exposed the wider abuse and Solange Boylard's murder, and in 1993, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. In 2011, Terriel's cellmate, sliced him up with a makeshift knife. He did not die a prophet as he had envisioned, but rather the heinous criminal he'd become. The Cokeville Miracle There are few things worse in the world than holding children hostage in their school. Even if the kids and teachers survive, the psychological effect on the rest of their lives is enormous. On Friday, May 16, 1986, the unthinkable happened at Cokeville Elementary School in Wyoming, when ex-Cokeville police officer David Young and his wife Doris entered the school wheeling a shopping cart. Inside was an improvised explosive device. David went to the school office, handing out a manifesto entitled Zero Equals Infinity, and announced this is a revolution. Teachers were confused and baffled by Young's nonsensical manifesto. Meanwhile, Doris went from classroom to classroom, 
luring 136 children, six faculty, nine teachers, and three other adults into a first grade classroom. She convinced them that there was either an emergency, a surprise, or an assembly there. David entered the room with the makeshift bomb trigger attached to his wrist, threatening the group that at any time if he moved his arm, the bomb would explode. He demanded a ransom of $2 million per hostage and an audience with President Ronald Reagan, who he had previously sent a copy of the manifesto. As parents and police gathered outside, inside the teachers did their best to occupy the terrified children with games, prayer, songs, and books. But the smell from the leaking gasoline bomb was getting unbearable, so their hostage takers allowed them to open the windows. After a two and a half hour standoff, all parties were getting increasingly agitated. David left the room briefly to use the bathroom and attached the bomb's detonation device to his wife's wrist. Doris, who was as terrified as the hostages, started begging the teachers to calm the restless children. By this time, Doris was experiencing a headache from the escaping gasoline fumes and inadvertently raised her hand to her forehead. This unintentionally activated the trigger mechanism and the bomb exploded, severely injuring Doris and filling the room with black smoke and pockets of fire. David returned to the scene in a panic and shot his wife and a teacher before returning to the bathroom where he shot himself. All the hostages managed to escape, although 79 were later hospitalized with burns and injuries, the majority of which were severe. During the carnage, Doris's burnt body was expelled through an open window and left lying on the front lawn. Luckily, two of the three blasting caps on the bomb failed to detonate. The wires to each had reportedly been cut. Had the bomb functioned fully, the death toll would have been huge. The reason for the wire cuts is still a mystery. When the bomb detonated, the majority of the explosive force was channeled through loose ceiling tiles in the classroom roof. Additionally, the open windows acted as vents and significantly mitigated the explosive power of the bomb. It was later revealed that David Young had initially planned to involve two of his friends and his youngest daughter from his first marriage, but at last minute, they all refused to go through with the plan. His daughter reported the incident at the town hall and the two friends were later found handcuffed in a van outside the school. No charges were ever brought against any of them. All told, 79 of the hostages suffered severe injuries, mostly second degree burns, smoke inhalation, and other injuries from the exploding bomb, and many have been left with lifelong psychological scars. Only David and Doris were killed, however it could have been so much worse, and that is why it's known as the Cokeville Miracle and not the Cokeville Massacre, because no one ever found out why those wires were cut. Felicitas Sanchez Agulian. Felicitas Sanchez Agulian was born in Cerro Azul, Veracruz in Mexico. Her mother was an uncaring woman who showed no affection towards her daughter. And Felicitas grew up knowing her mother didn't love her. Her troubled upbringing contributed to her psychopathic personality and aversion to maternal feelings. As a child, she started displaying unnatural behaviors and took pleasure in poisoning street dogs. However, despite having no compassion for anyone or anything, as an adult she trained to be a nurse and midwife. She also married a local man called Carlos Conde. Together the couple had twin girls, and although Carlos doted on his daughters, his wife wanted nothing to do with them, and suggested to him that they give them up for adoption. He reluctantly agreed, but after they left, he changed his mind and wanted his girls back. However, Felicitas, who had arranged the adoption, refused to tell her husband where their daughters were, and this eventually led to the couple's divorce in 1910. After the divorce, Felicitas moved to Mexico City, where she lived in an apartment building on Salamanca Street, Colonial Roma. She began to attend births and illegally perform abortions. She also started to trade in illegal adoptions and was arrested twice for practicing unlawful adoption and baby farming. As with many other baby farmers worldwide, Felicitas would take money from the newborn's mother, promising to use the funds to care for the child until they could be found an adopted home. The truth was, she would sell those as quickly as possible, and if she did not sell the child within a few days, then she would murder it. 
Felicitas then dismembered the bodies and incinerated them in the large furnace she had installed for that purpose. In other cases, she would flush the body parts down the toilet. On April 8, 1941, human remains were discovered near her home, and three days later, she was arrested, along with two accomplices, her second husband, Roberto, and a plumber called Salvador Martinez. On July 16, 1941, before she could be tried for her crimes, Felicitas committed suicide. The daughter she had with Roberto was placed in state care after her father was also convicted for involvement in the murders. It's estimated that Felicitas murdered as many as 100 children aged from newborn to three years old. Typically, she would poison or strangle them, and horrifically, sometimes she would dismember a child while they were still alive. It's no surprise that various newspapers named her the female ripper of colonial Roma and the human crusher of little angels. World War II Suicide Cliff Ladaran Banaduro is a cliff above Marpi Point Field on Saipan, the largest of the northern Mariana Islands in the Western Pacific. In 1919, Japan was awarded control of the island as part of its mandated territory of the South Seas Mandate, and soon after many Japanese families settled there. However, towards the end of World War II, the US planned to take the territory, and on June 15, 1944, 8,000 US Marines landed on the island, and the Battle of Saipan began. The naval bombardment had started two days earlier, and had already weakened the Japanese defences. But despite the Japanese soldiers being bombarded from all sides, their resistance was incredible. No amount of shelling could shake their resolve. The fighting was brutal, with many casualties on both sides. In desperation, some Japanese troops and civilians took cover in ravines, cliffs, and caves, and used them to ambush the US Marines, often with devastating consequences. In response, the Marines cleared out the caves with flamethrowers, often unaware that both civilians and troops were in them. The land, sea, and air battle was relentless, and after a few weeks, it was evident that the Japanese had lost their fight. The Americans had corralled the remaining Japanese forces and civilians into the northern tip of the island, but still, they refused to surrender. They had got word from Emperor Hirohito that all Japanese citizens, soldiers, and civilians left on Saipan were to commit suicide rather than surrender to the Americans. This was commonplace for the Japanese during war, with their adage being, do not live in shame as a prisoner, die and leave no ignominious crime behind you. In response to the message, their general ordered the largest Banzai charge of the entire war. On July 7, 1944, all the remaining Japanese troops, including those who were injured, along with a number of civilians, charged at the American army forces in a desperate last-ditch attempt to defeat them. The battle lasted 15 hours, and almost all of the Japanese troops were killed, along with hundreds of American soldiers. The American troops were battle-weary after a month of brutal fighting, and thought their ordeal was finally over. However, sadly, some of the worst horrors they would witness were yet to come. The Imperial Japanese Army had spread terrifying propaganda about what would happen to Japanese civilians, should they fall into American hands. According to them, they would expect to be raped, tortured to death, or even cannibalized by the savage enemy. The fear of this propaganda, and knowing their island was now captured, resulted in hundreds of Japanese citizens to edge towards Marpai Point, where entire families leapt to their deaths. Some parents slit their children's throats before throwing them over the edge and followed them to their demise. Worse still, groups huddled together with a grenade in the middle blowing themselves up after pulling the pin. Others chose to simply walk into the ocean until the waves engulfed them. In a desperate attempt to stop the senseless deaths, American troops called on already captured Japanese civilians to shout over loudspeakers to reassure their compatriots that they would be treated well if they surrendered. Some chose to surrender after hearing this, but others remained stubbornly loyal in their passionate commitment to their emperor and took their lives, and the lives of their families anyway. There is no official count of how many civilians took their own lives at the end of the Battle of Saipan, but estimates usually range between 800 and 1,000. 
The incident was one of the many great tragedies of a war that was marked by mass deaths of combatants and non-combatants alike. Today, the Okinawa Peace Memorial is located below the base of the cliff, where so many died, and the site has become a place that Japanese visit on a pilgrimage to console the souls of the dead. Whiskey Air Jameson Irish Whiskey is by far the best-selling Irish whiskey in the world. It was founded back in 1780 by a Scottish-born John Jameson, and through the years, the company has passed through the generations of the Jameson family. However, James S. Jameson, the great-great-grandson of John, brought shame on the family when he used his power and privilege to do the unspeakable and get away with it. In the late 1800s, James S. Jameson was the heir apparent to the family fortune, and like many rich people of the era, James used his considerable wealth to travel the world. He was an adventurous type, and would often tag along on expeditions of more accomplished explorers. In 1888, he joined the Emin Pasha Relief Expedition, led by renowned explorer Henry Morton Stanley, across Central Africa. The expedition was to take supplies to Emin Pasha, the leader of an Ottoman province in Sudan that was cut off by a revolt. However, in reality, it had a dual purpose, to occupy more land for the Belgian Free State Colony in the Congo. James was in command of the rear column of the expedition at Ribakiba, a trading post deep in the Congo, known for its cannibal population. When, for some bizarre reason, he mentioned to Tipu Tip, a slave trader and local fixer, that he had an interest in witnessing cannibalism firsthand. Tipu Tip then acquired a ten-year-old slave girl, for which James paid six handkerchiefs for, and talked to the chiefs of the village. The chiefs then paraded the girl, telling the villagers that she was a present from a white man who wished to see her eaten. The poor girl was then tied to a tree, whilst the natives sharpened their knives, before one of them stabbed her twice in the belly. Three men ran forward and began to cut up the girl's body, finally cutting off her head. Each man then took a piece away to the river to wash it and eat it, leaving not a particle behind. The extraordinary story was later recounted by the exhibition Sudanese translator Asad Farhan in an affidavit that was later published by the New York Times. In fact, in Jameson's own diary, he wrote of the incident, claiming the girl never screamed throughout the ordeal. She never uttered a sound or struggled. After the incident, James also made rough sketches of the horrible scenes and later finished them with watercolors. In his diary, he wrote, when I went home, I tried to make some small sketches of the scene while it was still fresh in my memory. After the New York Times article was published, James and his wife tried to play down the incident, saying he went along with it because he believed it to be a joke and could not imagine that the villagers would actually kill and eat a child, even though he knew they were cannibals. Sadly, it is likely the account is true, although varying accounts of the incident do exist. However, James Jameson never faced justice. He died shortly after the accusations in 1888, during a fever he had contracted during the trip. The Jameson family, with the help of the Belgian government, were able to hush up the atrocity, and to this very day, no one knows the real truth, but the hideous incident still hangs over the family legacy. What secrets do you hide from your family, and will you take it to your grave? Ask Reddit is a subreddit, where people ask and answer thought-provoking questions. Most are just general questions about relationships and life. But every now and then, a question is asked that produces a reply that can be quite disturbing. A few years ago, the question was asked, What secret do you hide from your family, and will you take it to your grave? As you would expect, it got a variety of responses, from cheating in exams to cheating on partners. However, one answer stood out, and even if it was fake, just the fact that someone would think it up is disturbing. We won't tell it word for word, but here is an overview of the story. We'll call the man Tom. Tom was out with his girlfriend Deb and her friend Sarah. Tom couldn't help notice that Sarah put a pin in her phone every time she took a photo. So out of the corner of his eye, he noted what she was entering and put it in his phone. A few months later, Deb and Sarah were over at Tom's place, and both of them took a swim in his pool. 
Sarah left her phone indoors, so as the girls swam, Tom took his opportunity to look through her phone, using the pin he had saved. He scrolled through Sarah's personal photos, some of which were nudes, and he discovered she was talking to a guy called Jeff, who had also sent her some intimate photos. Armed with Sarah's pictures and videos, Tom concocted a plan. First, he broke up with Deb, but kept in touch with Sarah. He then created an online alter ego who he called Vanessa. For months, he worked at creating Vanessa until her identity looked real. Vanessa then started following Sarah on all of her social media, and Tom knew that Sarah was the type of girl who always accepted friend requests and followed back. Through Vanessa, Tom then started blackmailing Jeff and told him if he didn't break things off with Sarah, he would leak all of his intimate photos. Knowing what he'd sent, Jeff broke it off with Sarah. Tom then tried to do the same to Sarah, again through Vanessa, saying she would expose all her intimate photos if she didn't stop talking to Jeff. But Sarah called Vanessa's bluff, so Tom decided to change tactics. Fake Vanessa backed off for a bit until Tom could get hold of Sarah's phone again. Tom invited Sarah over to his place where she mysteriously lost her phone. Tom promised to look for it and miraculously found it the next day and handed it back to her, but not before he installed a spy app that let him track Sarah's every move. A few weeks later, fake Vanessa again contacted Sarah, but this time she was armed with the conversation Sarah was having with everyone. Sarah confides in Tom about what is happening and breaks down crying, telling him about Jeff and that somebody had hacked both their phones and was blackmailing them. As Tom was known to be a tech expert, Sarah asked him if he could help her. What Tom did was convince Sarah that Jeff was Vanessa and it was him who was blackmailing her. Soon after, Sarah dumped Jeff for good and turned to her hero Tom who saved her, as she thought from some pretty distressing stuff being posted online. Sarah and Tom now had a shared bond, and not long after they started dating. Four years later, they were married. Tom ended the post with the chilling words, months of planned lies, blackmail, and espionage got me my wife. Corey Joanne Lamaster. On January 29th, 1994, two hikers searching for mushrooms came across a horrific sight in Pogo Nip Park, Santa Cruz. The naked, decomposed remains of a woman dumped in the middle of the trail and partially buried. With nothing to identify her, investigators who quickly arrived on the scene dubbed her Pogo Nip Jane. She'd been left in a shallow grave near a homeless campsite in the area, and it was estimated that she had died several weeks earlier, possibly in late 1993. It was soon determined that Jane Doe was in her late teens. She had short brown hair, pink painted nails, and was described as being petite. Her case was ruled as a homicide because her cause of death was established as bludgeoning with a metal object, such as a pipe, which led to her skull being crushed. The advanced state of decomposition made it difficult for detectives to ascertain her facial features, but they were able to make out that she had a tiny heart-shaped tattoo between her left thumb and forefinger. Furthermore, her teeth revealed that she'd had a few cavities in her lifetime, which were filled with porcelain, an isotope analysis of her hair revealed that she'd traveled between Santa Barbara and Santa Cruz, although she had lived in Pacifica. With little to go on, however, the case of Poganip Jane lay dormant for nearly two decades, until 2013. On February 26th that year, the original lead detective on the case, Sergeant Lauren Butch Baker, was murdered in an unrelated crime. He had often spoke about wanting to solve and close the case of Jane Doe, but had been unable to during his lifetime. In honor of his wishes, the Santa Cruz Police Department reopened the investigation and started from scratch. They enlisted the help of a facial reconstruction artist and had a clay model for Jane Doe's face made. Six years earlier in 2007, a family from Pacifica filed a missing persons report for their daughter, 17-year-old Corey Lamaster, who vanished in 1993 after running away from home in December. Corey's mother submitted a DNA sample for future comparisons, and in 2013, investigators got a partial hit. This led them to speak with Corey's adopted sister, who was living in Washington. She still had a fingerprint card from Corey's teen years and passed it on to authorities, who were able to match the prints with those of Poganip Jane. 19 years after she passed, Jane Doe had finally been identified. 
She was 17-year-old Corey Joanna Lamaster. It had never been made public why the family didn't report Corey missing until 2007. She was reportedly a frequent runaway, who when she left home often escaped to Santa Cruz and had been taken home by Santa Cruz police in the years before she vanished. Authorities have apparently agreed to only reveal that the teenager came from a troubled background. Despite being given back her name, however, Corey's case remains unsolved. A father and son seen traveling with her before she was murdered are persons of interest in the case, although they have never been named suspects. The son, Greg White, had passed away by the time Corey was identified. His father, Wayne, resided in Tennessee for a while, but he too passed away sometime after the identification. Investigators were able to question him on several occasions before his demise, but no charges were ever brought against him. If you have any information about the case, you can call the Santa Cruz Police Department's anonymous tip line on 831-420-5995. Creepy Hand this Reddit post was short and little information was given about it, but it seemed to creep out the Ask Reddit community, who had asked, what is the creepiest photo you've ever taken? Wookie Rage replied with this comment and caused a bit of a stir. It read, Me and my brother were out hiking when we came across this cool tree. We took this picture. Only later did we see the hands in the background. Take a look. Now we think this could be a setup, although it seems the poster is into wilding rather than anything creepy. But if it is genuine, to find that on one of your photographs would surely freak you out. What do you make of it? Just part of the tree, a hoax, or something strange? Stranger Under the Bed Back at Reddit again for this one, and this one is on the Let's Not Meet subreddit posted several years ago by a 22-year-old woman who was moving stuff into her first apartment. She said that the door that led into the apartment locked itself automatically when closed, so she didn't look back when she left her apartment to go to the entrance of the apartment complex to get her mail. As she walked back to her apartment, she was talking to her boyfriend on the phone, and when she went back into the apartment, she sat on the bed to read her mail. As she opened the letters, she dropped her phone on the floor and it landed under the bed so she had to lie on the floor and stretch for it. But as she did, something caught her eye. There was someone under the bed. The woman choked the urge to scream. The person was lying still with his back towards her and his head to his chest, so she couldn't see his face, and he didn't appear to see her. In a silent panic, she picked up her phone and in a loud voice said, Sorry I dropped my phone. I'm just going to take a shower and call you back. The bathroom was right by her bed, so she quickly walked in and quietly locked the door, turned on the shower and jumped out of the window. The apartment was on the first floor, and immediately called the police. They told her to wait nearby, but to go to the other side of the street to see if anyone comes out of the door to the complex. The woman walked across the street and hid behind a car until the police arrived. There she called her boyfriend and he came straight over, and shortly after the police arrived, she gave them her keys and they went inside. Moments later, two police officers came out holding a thin and tired looking man. His eyes looked crazy, but he did not resist arrest. One of the police officers who was standing beside her comforted her and later told her that the police found the man stood outside of her bathroom door with a kitchen knife, waiting for her to come out. This man had somehow crept into the entry door while she was collecting her mail and hid under the bed. It turns out he was a homeless person with mental health issues who was eventually admitted to a mental hospital. The police later told the woman that the way she acted probably saved her from a bad situation and had she screamed, things could have been very different. Owen Parfit If there was one thing Owen Parfit was known for in the 1760s, it was his stories. A former sailor and outlaw, the 60-something-year-old often spoke about the grand adventures he'd had overseas in the likes of Africa and America, practicing black magic, entering into illicit relationships, and doing things that weren't generally considered to be acceptable by society in those days. When he eventually returned home from his travels, suffering from rheumatoid arthritis and unable to walk, 
locals often said that his wild endeavours had finally caught up with him. As a young man, Owen had initially been doing an apprenticeship, working under his father who was a tailor, but he grew bored and frustrated and hated the job, so on a whim he went off to enlist under the King's banner. From here, Owen largely lost touch with his family. At first he was able to get a letter to them on occasion, letting them know where he was and what he was doing, but after a while those letters stopped and the family fell out of touch with him. When Owen finally returned to his hometown of Shepton Mallet in Somerset in the southwest of England, his parents were dead. The only person who remained was his sister, Mary, who was around 15 years his senior. She recognised him immediately, even at her elderly age, and the siblings moved into a cottage on the edge of town. By all accounts, they lived together happily. It was either 1763 or 1768 when things took a bizarre turn. Due to the fact that the case is centuries old, there is differing information about what year it was when the following events took place. But what we do know for certain is it was a warm evening. So Owen sat outside to enjoy the fresh air. At this point, Mary was around 80 years old and was not fit enough to move her brother without help. A neighbour, Susanna Schnuck, assisted the siblings regularly. On this occasion, she helped Mary move Owen to his chair outside before leaving again. Mary had work to do in the house, so she went back inside. When the elderly woman finally emerged again, Owen was gone. She asked the farm labourers across the street if they'd seen him. They hadn't. So she enlisted their help, and that of the neighbours, to help search for her missing brother. But Owen was nowhere to be seen, and he was physically incapable of walking anywhere on his own. So where could he have gone? How could someone take him in front of a group of labourers? But no one had seen or heard a thing. There were many questions buzzing around in Mary's head, but so few answers. There was no trace of Owen, it was like he'd vanished into thin air. Local gossipers spun rumours that he'd been taken by the devil or carried off by pirates who believed that Owen knew the location of buried treasure, but eventually the whispers died down and the case was mostly forgotten about. Then in 1813, the story started up again, when a human skeleton was found during construction that was taking place not far from Mary's cottage. The bones were determined to be from a young female, however, and remain unidentified to this day. With the discovery of the skeleton came more pointing fingers though, and they turned in the direction of Mary. Some of the townspeople wondered if she'd grown tired of caring for Owen, and she'd suddenly snapped in a fit of rage or exhaustion. But she was an eight-year-old woman who received her only income from caring for her brother, making it seem extremely unlikely that she had the motivation or physical capability to carry out such a thing. The only other theory proposed by modern sleuthers is the idea that perhaps Owen wasn't really Owen, and he was only identified by his sister when she was already an old woman. Perhaps he was an imposter who needed care, or perhaps he didn't even need care at all, and had feigned everything. But if this was the case, then what was his motive? The famous author, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, was known to be extremely interested in this case, but not even his clever and creative mind could come up with any explanation as to what truly happened to Owen Parfitt. The Bhopal Disaster Most of us are aware of the Chernobyl incident in 1986, when a nuclear power plant accident caused radioactive material to contaminate not only the immediate vicinity, but areas thousands of miles away. It was, and still is, the worst disaster in the history of nuclear power generation. However, just two years earlier, another lesser known catastrophe occurred in the city of Bhopal in India. It began on the night of December 2nd, 1984, as the incidents of Bhopal slept, around 45 tons of methyl isocyanate gas escaped from an incesticide plant, was owned by the Indian subsidiary of the American firm Union Carbide Corporation. The gas, which is deadly to humans, drifted silently over the densely populated neighborhood killing thousands of people, many of whom died in their sleep, while others succumbed to the effects of the gas in the following days and weeks. It's estimated that between 15,000 and 20,000 people lost their lives, while more than half a million were exposed to the toxic gas. The immediate effects included severe respiratory problems, eye irritation, and even blindness. The leak left a lasting impact on the survivors and the environment, 
and many people who are exposed to the gas continue to suffer from chronic health issues to this day that include respiratory problems, neurological disorders, and birth defects in their children. The contaminated site has also led to soil and water pollution, affecting the local ecosystem and the health of nearby communities. In the aftermath of the tragedy, governments around the world implemented stricter safety standards and regulations to prevent similar incidents. The lives of the Indian community were completely shattered by the incident, and to add insult to injury, many of the families were only offered a few hundred dollars in compensation. Our heart goes out to all of those who were, and still are being affected by one of the worst industrial accidents in history, that much of the world has never heard about. The Agent Orange Program The Agent Orange Program remains a dark and controversial chapter in history, and serves as a reminder of the cruelty of war and the importance of understanding the long-term effects of decisions made during conflicts. Agent Orange was a powerful herbicide used by the United States military during the Vietnam War. The program, which took place from 1961 to 1971, aimed to defoliate the dense jungles of Vietnam, to expose enemy hiding spots and disrupt their food supply. However, the consequences of this program were far more devastating than anticipated. Agent Orange was a 50-50 mix of two herbicides, 2,4-D and 2,4-5-T, a combination that created a highly toxic substance called dioxin, which is known to cause severe health problems and birth defects. The name Agent Orange comes from the orange striped barrels in which the mixture was stored. The US military sprayed approximately 20 million gallons of the substance over 4.5 million acres of land in Vietnam that led to the destruction of forests, crops and wildlife, as well as long-lasting health issues for both Vietnamese civilians and American soldiers. Subsequent studies have linked dioxin exposure to various cancers, neurological disorders and birth defects and many of the exposed to it continue to suffer from the effects of Agent Orange to this day. Although efforts have been made by the US government to compensate and recognize the suffering of those affected by Agent Orange, many Vietnamese civilians still struggle to receive recognition and support for the health issues they still face. The tragic true story of Tilikum, Seawold's killer whale. In 1983, a two-year-old killer whale was captured near Iceland. Following his capture, he was kept in a cement holding tank for nearly a year. The tank was so small, all he could do was swim around in circles. Finally, he was shipped to the rundown Sealand of the Pacific Public Aquarium in British Columbia, Canada, where he was given the name Tilikum. He lived with two other female captive whales, called Nootka and Haida. However, he failed to bond with the females, and often bullied and chased them, although he did eventually mate with one of them, and he sired the first of 13 offspring, making him the most successful breeding whale in captivity. Telecom was forced to perform eight times a day for the public, and the stress and exhaustion of this was making him ill and agitated. During his time in Canada, tragedy struck, when a young female orca trainer slipped and fell into the tank of killer whales. The three whales pounced on her, continually dragging her under the water until she was dead. Shortly after the incident, Sealand closed down. In 1992, Tilikum was sold to SeaWorld Orlando, where he took part in the world-famous shows and became a key part of the park's breeding program. Then in 1999, tragedy struck, and again Tilikum was involved. The body of a 27-year-old man was found floating in the orca pool, it is believed the young man had somehow found his way into the pool after breaking into the park. Investigations revealed that the man had been bitten several times by Tilikum, although it could not be proved that he actually killed him. By now, although Tilikum was relatively young, he was 22 feet and 6 inches long, weighing 12,300 pounds, and was the largest orca in captivity. His size meant he was becoming increasingly difficult to manage. The stress of captivity was also taking its toll, causing Tilikum to display abnormal behavior, and he started chewing on metal gates and the concrete sides of his tank. 
so much so that his teeth were almost completely worn down. He also had a collapsed dorsal fin, a sign that he was unhealthy and stressed. Tillicum's aggression towards humans continued, and in 2010, Dawn Branchiao, his devoted trainer, became his next victim when he dragged her into the pool by her ponytail in front of a horrified audience. He proceeded to scalp and dismember her, ripping her arms off and breaking several bones in her body before drowning her. Dawn's death was a huge shock to everyone, especially to her fellow trainers, as she had an amazing relationship with Tillicum. She loved him dearly, and they believed he loved her. Following Dawn's tragic death, Tillicum was kept in a tiny enclosure with limited ability to swim or communicate with anyone. It was reported that he spent his days floating listlessly in the water, a behaviour never before seen in an orca. However, just a year later, Tillicum was returned to performing, again putting lives at risk, and causing further stress to him. He died in 2017 after suffering a bacterial infection. He had spent 33 years in captivity and likely hated every minute of it. I think we'll all agree that this majestic and magnificent creature should never have been captured in the first place. The Horror of Early Victorian Surgery It seems hard to appreciate modern day life at the moment, with worries about nuclear wars, the changing climate and other highly charged issues. However, if we take a step back in time, it is easier to appreciate what we have now compared to people in Victorian times, especially when it comes to healthcare. Medical care in the Victorian era was a horrifying, gruesome affair, and the chances of surviving surgery were so low that patients had to pay up front in case they died and surgeons didn't get their fees. Hygiene was practically non-existent, with vermin and bugs living alongside patients in medical wards and surgeons proudly reusing the same stained tools and blood-soaked aprons in operation after operation, and they seldom washed their hands or tools before surgery. Hospitals also employed bug catchers, who were sometimes paid more than doctors, to rid beds of lice and other critters. But perhaps most horrifying of all was there was no anaesthetic. Patients were awake through the entire procedure, howled or tied down as they screamed and struggled against the knife. The lack of anesthesia made every operation sheer torture, with not only patients going out of their minds during operations, but also surgeons who were traumatized by the pain they were inflicting. Many of the surgeons were unskilled, and some even illiterate, and they were more in demand for their speed rather than their skill, as speed made a difference in terms of pain and survival. One of the more respected surgeons in 19th century London was Robert Liston, who it was said could take apart a man's leg in 30 seconds. During one of his most infamous operations, he moved so fast that he accidentally cut off his assistant's fingers, who later died of gangrene. If all that wasn't bad enough, surgery was often a public affair, and in an age long before movies and television, many would attend surgeries for the entertainment value of seeing the struggle between life and death, like some sort of real-life horror film. Alexander the Great Alexander III of Macedon, better known as Alexander the Great, was the king of the ancient Greek kingdom of Macedon. He took to the throne in 336 BC, aged just 20, and during his 13-year reign, he created one of the largest empires of the ancient world, stretching from Greece to northwestern India. Alexander met his untimely death in 323 BC, aged just 32, after he fell ill and died after 12 days of excruciating suffering. It's long been debated what his cause of death was, with theories ranging from malaria, typhoid and alcohol poisoning, to assassination by one of his rivals. According to historical accounts, Alexander's body didn't begin to show signs of decomposition for a full six days after his death. And in recent years, and with the hindsight of modern medicine, the mystery about his unexpected death may have finally been solved, and his passing may have been grislier than historians had ever imagined. It is suggested that Alexander may have suffered from the neurological disorder Guillain-Barre syndrome, 
a rare but serious autoimmune disorder in which the immune system attacks healthy cells in the nervous system. It explains the odd symptoms Alexander was suffering from and also explains why no immediate signs of decomposition were noted after he was declared dead, as it's possible he was still alive. The condition would have rendered him paralyzed and his breathing less visible. Because in ancient times doctors relied on the presence or absence of breath rather than a pulse to determine whether a patient was alive or dead, he was likely declared dead up to six days before his actual demise. So poor Alexander could have been alive during the preparations for his funeral and burial, that included being laid in a gold anthropoid sarcophagus that was filled with honey, which was then placed in a gold casket, and is now being considered that his death may be the most famous case of pseudothanotis, or false diagnosis of death ever recorded. Holodomor, killing by hunger. We're all aware of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent bloody war that is still being fought. However, it's not the first time the Ukrainian people have suffered at the hands of a Russian leader. In 1932, when Ukraine was still part of the USSR, Russia's leader, Joseph Stalin, forced starvation on the Ukrainian people, a dark chapter in history that is often overlooked. Stalin started implementing policies that would have tragic consequences. One of these policies was the forced collectivization of agriculture. This meant that individual farms were combined into large state-controlled collective farms. The goal was to increase agricultural output and support the rapid industrialization of the Soviet Union. However, the Ukrainian farmers, who were fiercely independent, resisted giving up their land and livelihood to the state. And as a result of this resistance, Stalin made things worse by increasing grain quotas, meaning more and more Ukrainian-grown grain had to be handed over to the state, leaving little for the farmers themselves. As a result, a man-made famine swept through Ukraine, causing widespread suffering and death. The exact number of people who died during Holodomor is still debated, but estimates range from 3 to 7 million. The famine was so severe that people resorted to unthinkable acts, such as cannibalism, in order to survive. The Soviet government denied the existence of the famine, and even went as far to export grain to other countries, while their own people starved. It wasn't until the 1980s that the truth about this incident began to emerge. Today it's recognized as a genocide by many countries, and efforts are being made to ensure that this tragedy is not forgotten. Memorials have been erected in Ukraine and around the world to honor the victims of this tragic event, as a reminder of the devastating consequences of twisted political power. The Texarkana Phantom This chilling story of the Texarkana Phantom begins in Texarkana, a small town which straddles the border between Texas and Arkansas. In the spring of 1964, four vicious crimes occurred in less than three months. Three were brutal attacks on young couples parked in Lover's Lane, and the fourth was the senseless shooting of a middle-aged couple in their rural farmhouse on the Arkansas side. Three of the victims survived with serious injuries, but five were shot dead. The traumatized survivors could offer the police little to go on, and fear swept through the town, forcing women and children to flee their homes and check into hotels when their husbands were away on business. People who never owned guns slept with loaded weapons on their bedside cabinets and made makeshift beds for their children to sleep beside them. Others rigged up crude security systems attaching pots and pans to wire that were strung around their property. The elusive killer dubbed the Texarkana Phantom evaded police despite a massive search and he remained at large, leaving behind few clues and no concrete leads. Over the years, several theories have emerged about the identity of the Phantom. Some believe he was a local man with a grudge against young couples, while others speculate that he was a transient who moved on after the murders stopped. To this day, the true identity of the Phantom remains a mystery, and is the number one unsolved murder case in Texas history. The Ravenous Beast of Gévaudan Lastly, we'll take a look at the chilling tale of the Beast of Gévaudan, 
a mysterious creature that terrorized the French countryside in the 18th century. The horror took place between 1764 and 1767 in the remote region of Gévaudan, now modern day Lazur in south central France, at a time when superstition and fear of the unknown very much influenced the minds of its residents. The first reported attack occurred in June 1764 when a young woman was tending to her cattle. She claimed that a large wolf-like creature lunged at her, but her cattle managed to drive it away. This was just the beginning. Over the next three years, the beast claimed over 100 victims, mostly women and children, leaving the people of Jovodan in a state of panic. Witnesses described the beast as a massive, wolf-like creature with reddish fur, a wide chest, and a long, thick tail. Its head was said to be somewhat like a dog, but with large, dark eyes and a mouthful of razor-sharp teeth. The beast was known for its incredible speed, agility, and strength making it a formidable predator. The wounds it inflicted on its victims were mostly to the head and limbs, with at least 16 victims decapitated. As the death toll continued to rise, the people of Jovedan pleaded for help, and King Louis XV sent professional hunters and even his own personal gun bearer to capture or kill the beast. However, despite their efforts, the creature continued to evade capture. Many theories have been proposed about the true identity of the beast of Jevodan. Some believe it was a pack of wolves, while others suggest it was a hyena, or even a lion, that had escaped from captivity. Some even believe that it was a werewolf, or a supernatural creature. However, without any genetic or forensic evidence, the beast of Jevodan is likely to forever remain a mystery. That is unless it strikes again in the future. Eta Supa. This is another that is rooted more in folklore, but there are some kernels of truth to it. Across Scandinavia, particularly in Iceland, Sweden and Norway, there are many natural precipices that jut out from the rocky landscape, which face directly onto the land below, which can often be just as jagged and rocky as the cliff face next to it. In prehistoric times, when the tales of rituals and old gods were whispered across the land, these cliffs, known as Atastupa, were according to sources from the time, the sites of some of the most upsetting and gruesome scenes history has shown us yet. Procopius of Caesarea, a Greek scholar, first documented the practice when writing about the Heruli, an early Germanic tribe who originated in Scandinavia, and there are many references to it throughout the religion's folklore. When elderly members of the tribe reached a certain age, they would be ritually taken up to the side of the cliff. When they reached the top, they would jump, shattering their bodies on the rocks and earth below. This practice may have had roots in social or religious areas, and has lived on in the folklore of these countries for generations. Hotel Dal Santo Once a popular tourist attraction in Bogota, Colombia, the Hotel de Santo has a dark and creepy backstory. Built in 1923 with beautiful French architecture, the hotel was initially a mansion for Carlos Arturio Tapias, an architect himself. If the building itself wasn't amazing enough to look at, it overlooks the majestic Tequindama Falls and is built on a huge cliff overlooking the surrounding rainforest. In the early 1990s, however, the hotel was shut down due to an issue with contaminated river water and has been abandoned since. The hotel's creepy history is rooted in native Colombian folklore. The hotel is allegedly built on a popular suicide hotspot, specifically for the native Muisca people, who would often jump from to Queen Dama Falls to escape being captured and tortured by the invading Spanish in their initial South American conquests, which saw them overthrow the Aztecs and Incas. As a result, several strange occurrences have been reported to those visiting the hotel's grounds, including figures that have been spotted wandering the halls and grounds, and voices whispering in what people claim to be the language of the Muisca people. Loud piercing cries have been heard from inside the rooms of the hotel, and at one point a woman was allegedly murdered there by a guest, disturbed by the things that he had witnessed in the hotel. 
People have claimed to have seen a woman matching her description wandering the grounds as well. The deadly phone number. In 2010, Mobitel, a mobile phone company in Bulgaria, suspended the phone number 0888888888 from customer use due to several strange happenings surrounding mobile users who previously owned it. Vladimir Groshnov was the first to own a phone with this number, who passed away from cancer in 2001, not long after using the number. Following this, the number was passed on to a member of the Bulgarian Mafia. In 2003, shortly after switching to the number, he was killed by an assassin while eating at a restaurant in the Netherlands. The next person to own the number was a corrupt estate agent who had been privately selling huge amounts of cocaine in a secret trafficking organization he had set up. He was also assassinated outside an Indian restaurant in 2005. Mobitel have now allegedly stopped using this number permanently, and when the number is called, the caller hears a message stating that the number is outside of network coverage. It's most likely a strange coincidence, but a creepy one nonetheless. Rainbow Valley For those who succeed climbing Mount Everest is an amazing achievement, and one that they can look back on for the rest of their lives. A little over 5,000 people have managed to reach the summit and safely get back down again, but for others, it's not that simple. Rainbow Valley is an area of Mount Everest located at 80,000 meters in altitude on the peak's northern ridge. Climbers who pass this section of the mountain will be met with the grisly sight of numerous dead climbers who have been unsuccessful in scaling this part of the mountain, giving the area its name from their brightly colored jackets, oxygen supplies and climbing equipment. It is the point on the mountain where the most climbers have perished, and due to the location and nature of the region where they died, some of the bodies are impossible to reach or remove, and are left where they fell. These climbers are likely to have been killed by running out of oxygen, falling, or harsh weather. A grisly sight for anyone trying to reach the summit of Mount Everest. The Dancing Disease of 1518 Another historical horror story from what is now modern-day France in 1518, a very peculiar plague struck the city of Strasbourg, which at that time was part of the Holy Roman Empire. It started when one woman, named Mrs. Trophia, began uncontrollably dancing in the streets in the July of 1518. She perished, only stopping when exhaustion took over, and she collapsed from sheer tiredness, continuing even when she injured herself. In the first week of this bizarre occurrence, 30 more people joined her, exhibiting the same symptoms. For some strange reason, the civic and church leaders of Strasbourg decided it would be a good idea to encourage the dancing in order to stop it. As such, they arranged for dancing halls to be set up in the town centre, with musicians and professional dancers joining the affected from out of town. This only made things worse, and by the mysterious abrupt end of the plague in the September of that same year, 400 people had been affected, some of which passed away from their injuries. Although explanations from the time listed demonic possession as the most likely cause, it is now thought that the fungal infection known as ergot, passed on from eating contaminated bread, caused the outbreak. It surely was a strange moment in history. The Knock The idea of being in a space is likely mind-boggling to anyone who hasn't been there, but it seems there are moments in space that even the trained astronauts find tricky to comprehend. Yang Lui was China's first man in space, who first went up there in 2003, alone in a spacecraft all to himself. As he was up there, at work inside the craft, he heard what he described as somebody knocking on the side of the craft. Looking out of the porthole closest to where he heard the knock, he could not see anything that may have caused it. It's certainly a terrifying thought, but the explanation may be rooted in familiar science. Theories have ranged from part of the craft contracting or expanding, to some form of space debris hitting the side of the craft. It's highly unlikely that some otherworldly being was responsible for the knocking, but it definitely piques the imagination, and I'm sure it was pretty creepy for Yang. The 
the Champawat Tiger. We spoke about the Beast of Javordan earlier in this video, but here is a story of an animal much more familiar. The Champawat Tiger was a single female Bengal tiger, who towards the end of the 19th century in Nepal and India, was responsible for an estimated 436 human deaths. Every one of the tiger's victims were killed in broad daylight, and she managed to evade the hunters that were first sent out to kill her. When the hunters failed, soldiers organized a huge patrol to send the tiger away from the area, which proved successful. But then the deaths continued in other areas. The tiger proved to be exceptionally intelligent. She would adapt her hunting style to specifically hunt human beings, covering huge stretches of land during the night and attacking in the day. It wasn't until 1907 until a tiger was finally killed by Jim Corbett, a British hunter. He stalked the tiger for two days, almost becoming prey himself, before the tiger was finally shot, something which took two guns to do so. Major Henry Rathbone It's possible that you haven't heard of Henry Rathbone before, but he was an indirect second victim of one of the biggest tragedies in US history, the Lincoln assassination. Henry was a US Army major, and the night Lincoln was shot in the Ford Theater, he was accompanying him with his partner, Clara Harris. It was Henry who attempted to apprehend John Wilkes Booth after he fired, and was stabbed in the arm as a result after suffering several wounds. Henry and Clara soon married and had three children, but Henry was an unfortunate victim of severe survivor's guilt and could never get over that night in the theater with Lincoln and Booth. Henry couldn't forgive himself for not being able to stop the assassination and descended deep into mental illness as a result, suffering torturous hallucinations. The family eventually moved to Germany and on the Christmas Eve of 1883, a delirious Henry became violent with his family before hurting himself in the process. He shot Clara, killing her, and stabbed himself several times with a sharp knife, eerily recreating that fateful night. Henry was sent to an asylum where he spent the remainder of his life, passing away in 1911. He was subsequently buried in Germany, his body next to Clara's. The Lady of the Dunes in the July of 1974, a 12-year-old girl and her dog stumbled across the remains of a woman, estimated to have died two weeks prior, in the Race Point Dunes of Provincetown, Massachusetts. The body showed no signs of a struggle, and she was lying on her back, a pair of jeans under her head, indicating that she may have been asleep when she died. The head was almost removed from the body, and she had suffered a deep head wound, caused by a shovel-like entrenching tool. The victim was missing several teeth, both hands and one forearm. Police initially searched through thousands of missing person cases for the woman, but there was no match, and over the years, many facial reconstructions have been developed to try and identify her. To this day, it is unknown who she actually is. We do know, however, who committed the crime. Hayden Clark admitted to the atrocity, but has refused to tell the police anything about who the deceased woman was, on the account of him being poorly treated in the investigation. Jen Sakine and Hiroko Kazama. This is a terrifying story from Japan about two dog breeders turned murderers. Jen Sakine and Hiroko Kazama, from the town of Chichibu, were highly reputable in their trade, but were also known to be shady, with their business laced with crimes such as stealing, fraud, and associations with the Yakuza. Things took an even darker turn after one particular sale. Sakine was evidently adept at swindling money, but was bad with spending it, which resulted in tricky financial times for the couple in the early 90s. Two breeding dogs were sold to the company director of an industrial waste disposal company by Sakine in 1993 for 11 million yen. This sale was a scam. The female dog was too old to breed, and was worth 100 times less than the selling price. When the customer demanded a refund, Sakine and his wife came to the conclusion that due to their poor financial situation, they were unable to pay it back. So what did they do? They killed him. He was in fact the first of four victims of these heinous crimes, where a similar series of events would take place. The victims mysteriously disappeared, killed by the couple, 
before being transported to the nearby mountains to be finally chopped up into unrecognisable pieces. What couldn't be chopped was burned in an oil drum. The couple were, in 1995, eventually brought to justice, when the disappearances were linked and investigated by the police. The evidence pointed to Sakain and Kazama, who were both sentenced to death. Sixteen years after the sentence was passed out, Sakain died from illness, but Kazama remains on death row to this date. Zana. This is another tragic story, which this time takes place in 19th century Abkhazia, on the border between Russia and Georgia. One cold evening in the misty woodlands of the region, hunters have captured an individual who, from sources at the time, was described as being half woman, half animal. The individual was brought to the estate of the local nobleman, Edig Janaba, who named the wild woman Zana. Zana lived with Janaba until her death, and over time grew accustomed to life on his estate. As she warmed to her captors, she was treated more and more like a person and less like an animal, allowed to walk freely amongst the people of the estate. Zana was unlike anything these people had seen before, however. She never once spoke, preferring to communicate in a series of grunts, howls and shouts. She refused all clothing that was offered to her, and her two metre tall body was covered in a thick layer of hair, leading many to brand Zana as a yeti or similar cryptid. She also allegedly possessed extreme strength and great athleticism. She was supposedly able to lift a 50 kilogram sack above her head with ease and outrun a racehorse. When Zana died, she was buried in Janaba's family cemetery, the location of which is not known. Zana did, however, give birth to at least two sons and two daughters from different fathers on Janaba's estate throughout her life. One of these sons, a man named Quit, had his grave identified and studied in 1971, and in 2013, his remains were sent off to Professor Brian Sykes at the University of Oxford. Sykes, an expert of genetics, was able to reveal Zana's tragic backstory. Zana's ancestry, based on Sykes' studies, proved to be 100% of sub-Saharan African origins. A possible explanation for the story is that Zana was captured as a slave in Africa, managed to escape in the Abkhazia region, and spent a long time wandering the wilds and sustaining herself in the wilderness before Janaba's men captured her. This is surely one of history's strangest and saddest tales. The Eruption of Lake Nyos Lake Nyos, located in northwestern Cameroon, is a large, deep crater lake which sits on the side of an inactive volcano. Underneath the lake lies a big pool of magma which causes carbon dioxide to seep into the lake water, converting it into carbonic acid. Tragedy struck in 1986 when the lake erupted, launching over one cubic kilometer of gas into the surrounding air. Firstly, the lake's water level dropped by about a meter after the gas was released, and trees from the surrounding forests were knocked down. A hundred meter tall column of water and foam built up, causing a 25 meter wave that crashed against the lake shore. The invisible cloud of gas travelled between 20 and 50 kilometres per hour down the valley and into the surrounding villages, where the carbon dioxide suffocated any living being it came into contact with. This resulted in the tragic deaths of 1,746 people and around 3,500 livestock. A further 4,000 people managed to escape the gas, but many of them suffered dangerous respiratory conditions in the aftermath of the silent, deadly disaster. The truth behind Frankenstein. Most people are familiar with the story of Frankenstein, written by Mary Shelley in 1818. The tale of a scientist who brings a human-like creature to life from the remains of the dead. Shelley is renowned for writing one of the most famous works of fiction in human history, but just how much of it is really fiction? It turns out that Shelley might have been inspired by her own work a little too much. Shelley owned a pet dog, Richard, a dog that she performed grisly experiments on, similar to the ones performed by Dr. Frankenstein in the book. Writing in the Journal of Transplantation in 1821, Shelley describes in her own words what she did. Using a general anaesthetic to knock Richard out, she surgically removed all four of his legs, replacing the front ones with those of a cat, 
and the hind ones with those from a young Shetland pony. She then passed shockwaves through the limbs, which she spent hours attaching, and waited for Richard to wake up. He was alive, surprisingly. He also had problems walking, unsurprisingly. Richard spent the following months in a shack at the back of her house, where she would only take him out at night. He eventually escaped, allegedly running away to a house inhabited by a human man, who had been the victim of similar experiments involving a dog, a prawn and an octopus. But you can believe as much of that as you want. The Plague Riots When the plague struck Moscow, in the 1770s all hell broke loose. The terrified citizens, furious that the authorities had imposed forced quarantines before destroying their contaminated properties, caused a great deal of unrest amongst the Russian people. The first riots took place when a huge mob of the infected broke into the Kremlin, destroying the Chodov Monastery, home of the Archbishop. The Archbishop managed to flee to a neighbouring monastery, Donskoy, but citizens soon managed to capture that one too, killing the bishop in the process. Several of the quarantine zones keeping the infected in were destroyed, and the mob marched once again to the Kremlin in the following days, where the Russian military was waiting for them. The military opened fire on the rebels after they issued their demands of surrendering the lieutenant overseeing the quarantine process, and the mob was dispersed. Once the rebellion was put down, 165 adults were brought to trial, and the authorities executed the four individuals who had started the riots as well as, strangely, the church bell that the rebels used to start their alarm. The bell was partially dismantled and left silent in the church tower for over three decades. It now resides in the Kremlin's Armory Museum. They're on the moon watching us. Finishing off with another creepy space story, this one surrounds the first American moon landing and astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin the first and second men on the moon. The initial moon landing had been the subject of many strange conspiracy theories in its time, many of which we've covered on Destination Declassified, but this one might be the strangest. Allegedly, in a confidential message to NASA he recorded following the landing, Neil Armstrong is supposed to have spoken these strange words. These babies were huge, sir, enormous. Oh God, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecrafts out here lined up on the far side of the crater's edge. They're on the moon watching us. Now, believe as much of that as you will, but it's certainly an unsettling message if it's true. Buzz Aldrin also claimed to have seen a light moving alongside the craft whilst on this mission. What do you think took place up there? The Bakery Workers Who Got Baked in 2001, a horrific accident happened due to a company cutting corners and trying to save money, something we've heard far too often. David Mays and Ian Erickson, bakery workers at Harvest Time Bakery in Leicester, were asked to repair an oven that had broken down. The machine should have been allowed to cool for 12 hours, but was only left for two when the men clambered in to make the repairs. They climbed through the bottom of the oven onto a conveyor used to take the dough through the giant machine. All they were wearing were thin, all-in-one suits, and little did they know that the centre of the oven was still 100 degrees centigrade, hot enough to boil water. Ericsson had taken a radio in with him, and after a few minutes inside, he sent a panicky message saying it was too hot, but by this time, the two men were trapped. There was no system for reversing the conveyor or quickly getting them out of the oven. It took 17 minutes for the conveyor to pass through the oven before the men could be helped. Ericsson was brought out in a state of collapse with extensive burns and Mays was trapped inside the oven and by the time he was freed had 80% burns to his body and died at the scene. The tragedy occurred because the bakery put productivity above safety. The repair should have taken four men 12 hours, meaning the company would have lost £1,120 for every hour the oven was shut down. To save money, they baked two of their employees instead. The Hoarder, who lost her son's body. In 2016, Rita Wolfenson was living alone in her home in Brooklyn. Rita, who was registered blind, had for many years collected things that filled her house to the brim. 
Rita was married with two grown-up sons, but unfortunately her husband died in 1987, and one of her sons died in 2003. Rita had lost contact with extended family members, although she had recently rekindled communication with her brother, which led to the horrific discovery found in her house. Rita had been admitted to hospital after suffering a bad fall, and her brother's wife went to Rita's house to collect some clothes and toiletries for her stay there. When she entered the home, she was struck by the overwhelming stench of rotting food. The house was crammed with hoarded items and rubbish. However, worse was to come, as upstairs in one of the bedrooms was a fully intact skeleton lying on a mattress wearing clothes. The police were called, and after investigations it was revealed, the remains belonged to Rita's other son, Louis. The discovery was news to Rita, as she was under the impression her son had moved out of their Brooklyn home 20 years prior. The room where he was found was filled to the brim with garbage and rotting food that likely masked the smell of rotting flesh, and Rita wouldn't have been able to see or smell the decomposing body of her son. Incredibly, the police believed Rita was telling the truth and had no idea she had been living for many years with her son's corpse. An autopsy confirmed there were no suspicious circumstances and Lewis died of natural causes. Sanju Bhagat As a child, Sanju Bhagat from Nagpur, India, was healthy enough, although he had a noticeably protruding stomach. As he got older, he was teased and nicknamed the pregnant man by locals. However, in his 20s, Bhagat's stomach ballooned and was so swollen he looked nine months pregnant and could barely breathe. He lived with the affliction for several years, not knowing what was causing it, until one night in June 1999, the then 36-year-old's breathing got so bad that he was rushed to hospital, where doctors thought he might have a giant tumour. They operated on Bagat, fearing the worst, but during the operation, the surgeon saw something that he had never encountered before. As he cut into Bagat's stomach, gallons of fluid poured out, and inside the stomach cavity, there appeared to be many bones, some hair, and genitalia. It seemed there was some strange half-formed creature living in Bagat's tummy. What had been removed was actually the mutilated body of Bagat's twin brother. Since birth, Bagat had been living with one of the world's most bizarre medical conditions, a fetus in fetu, an extremely rare abnormality that occurs when a fetus gets trapped inside its twin. The trapped fetus can then survive as a parasite by forming an umbilical cord-like structure that leaches to its twin's blood supply until it grows so large that it starts to harm its host. Fetus in fetu happens very early in a twin pregnancy when one fetus wraps around and encompasses the other. The strongest fetus grows while the fetus that would have been its twin lives on throughout the pregnancy, feeding off its host twin like a parasite. At birth, usually both twins die from the strain of sharing a placenta, however in this case, the host twin, Bagot, survived. As soon as Bagot's twin was removed, his pain and inability to breathe disappeared. It's just a shame that it took 36 years to diagnose. Two-year-old boy regurgitated alive by a hippo. You heard that right. In December 2022, it emerged that a toddler had a lucky escape in an accident so horrific, it must have scared the young boy for life. Two-year-old Igapol had been playing at his home near Lake Edward in Uganda when a hippo grabbed him from the shore and started to swallow him whole. A brave onlooker saw the incident and began throwing stones at the animal to scare it into letting the boy go. By this time, the beast had half swallowed the boy. Luckily, the hippo spat out the child and he was rescued. After the incident, the terrified child was treated in hospital for injuries to his hand and given a rabies shot. He has since made a full physical recovery. Residents who lived near the lake were warned by authorities that all wild animals are very dangerous and see humans as a threat. Hippos are the second largest land mammals on earth and have a reputation for being aggressive and have been known to snap a canoe in half with their bite and kill an estimated 500 humans a year in Africa. That little boy had a very lucky escape.
Mohamed Mesfoui Waldab. In the early 1900s, Mohamed Mesfoui worked as a shoemaker and trader in Marrakesh, Morocco, along with his female assistant, 70-year-old Anna. Outwardly, he was a helpful and friendly man, but he used his shop to lure female customers, and with the help of Anna, drugged and killed at least 36 women. After incapacitating them, he cut their heads off with a dagger. Many of his mutilated victims were found in a pit under his shop. Eventually he was caught and confessed he killed his victims for money, and in 1906, Muhammad was sentenced to be crucified. This was later changed to beheading. However, the public was so outraged by his crimes, they demanded that he should suffer for what he did. So every day for four weeks, he was led from his cell into the market square and lashed 10 times with a rod made from thorny acacia whilst the baying crowd watched on. It was finally decided because of the heinous nature of his crimes, and as a warning to others, Muhammad would be walled up alive in the Marrakesh marketplace. On June 11th, 1906, he was led inside the wall through a hole that had been created that was two foot wide and about six foot high. Chains were attached to the back wall to ensure Muhammad did not attempt to escape and to keep him standing. Screaming for mercy, he fought to escape but was eventually chained up as bystanders threw filth and offal at him. The masons then came forward to brick up the opening. After his interment, the crowd went silent, but would cheer whenever they heard him scream inside. Mesfui could be heard for two days before falling silent on the third day. Following his death, many in the crowd voiced their anger that he had died too quickly. Stephen Slevin In 2005, Stephen Slevin was arrested for driving under the influence of alcohol and other minor charges. He was detained in a New Mexico county jail. Soon after his arrest, it was determined that Slevin suffered from depression and was a suicide risk. These concerns led to him being put in solitary confinement, despite never attending court. There, he stayed for 22 months, apparently forgotten about. He was regularly prescribed medicine without actually seeing a doctor. During his confinement, Stephen's mental and physical health declined and he resorted to pulling his own tooth out after he was denied access to a dentist. He lost weight and developed a horrific fungal infection on his skin. His hair and toenails grew long and unkempt. His family and attorney tried to get him freed and he was only released after it was deemed his mental state was so bad he was unfit to participate in his defense. Speaking after his ordeal, Stephen said, Why did they do what they did? I have no idea. His torture was acknowledged, and he was awarded a settlement of $15.5 million in a case that should never have happened in modern-day USA. You can't even begin to imagine what he must have been going through, wondering whether or not he would ever be released. Not yet dead. In June 2023, 76-year-old Ecuadorian nurse Bella Montoya was admitted to hospital with a possible stroke and cardiopulmonary arrest. And when she did not respond to resuscitation, a doctor on duty declared her dead. As you can imagine, you know where this story is heading. On June 9th, Bella was placed in a coffin and taken to a funeral parlor where relatives held a vigil before her planned burial. After around five hours, they opened the coffin to change Bella's clothes ahead of her funeral. It was then that the family noticed something was definitely not right. They were shocked to see the corpse move her hand and open her eyes. It was evident Bella was still alive. The family immediately called an ambulance, and Bella was taken back to the hospital where she had been declared dead. Sadly, despite efforts to save her for a second time, Bella died seven days later, and her remains were taken back to the same funeral home where she woke up. There is footage of this on the internet, but we decided against showing it as it is quite distressing. Mattress Jump at Day Yongak Hotel. On December 25th, 1971, a fire broke out at a 22 story Day Yongak Hotel in Seoul, South Korea. In this dramatic photo, a man trapped on an upper floor jumps clinging to a mattress in a desperate attempt to cushion his fall. Sadly, it did not help the man, and he died along with 157 other people.
sweet kiss of death. On June 4th, 1923, 22-year-old jockey and horse trainer Frank Hayes lined up for a race at Balmont Park Racetrack in New York. He was riding 20 to 1 outsider Sweet Kiss. Frank was relatively inexperienced as a jockey, having never won a race before. The horse made steady progress through the race and crossed the finish line, winning by a head. Shortly after the race, Miss Frailing, the horse's owner, and race officials rushed over to congratulate Frank and the horse, only to discover the jockey was unresponsive. In fact, he was dead. It's thought Frank died in the later part of the race, and his body remained in the saddle before crossing the line in front. It was suggested that the fatal heart attack that killed him might have been brought on by Hayes' extreme efforts to meet the weight requirements, as he had slimmed down from 142 pounds to 130 pounds in a very short time. Hayes was buried three days later, dressed in his racing silks. The horse never raced again, and it's claimed that Sweet Kiss was nicknamed Sweet Kiss of Death for the rest of her life. Frank Hayes was the first, and so far only jockey known to have won a race after death. Russian Killer In December 1997, a spat of incredibly gruesome killings occurred in the snow-covered wilderness in Russia's Far East. The first victim was a 47-year-old poacher called Vladimir Markov, whose headless and eviscerated body was found near his remote cabin. Several days later, the killer struck again. This time the victim was a young former soldier who'd gone hunting in the forest. All that was left of him was some blood-drenched clothing, his watch, his crucifix, and a pair of boots. In both cases, the killer had targeted the victims and waited patiently for several days before carrying out its brutal ambush. On the second occasion, the assassin had even carried a mattress from a nearby hut to lie comfortably while waiting for his victim to turn up. Both killings had been carefully plotted and clinically executed. Both victims had also been eaten. However, this wasn't some deranged human serial killer. It was a tiger. It appears that Markov had stolen part of the tiger's kill, sawing off a couple of haunches of boar, which the tiger had left in the snow for a later meal. By doing so, he made a very powerful enemy, an alpha male tiger, over nine feet long, from nose to tail, weighing about 500 pounds, who possessed great intelligence, astonishing memory, and a highly vengeful nature. Markov seemed to have known that the tiger was hunting him down, and he faced a dilemma. Either leave his cabin in the forest and never return, or take the tiger on and destroy it. Markov chose to take the tiger on, with deadly consequences. After he mauled Markov, the tiger turned his attention to another human, Andrei Pashemnia, a young former soldier unconnected to Markov, was just an ordinary local boy trying to make ends meet by foraging in the forest. Andre was aware of the tiger, but was young and confident he could take it on with his rusty old bolt-action rifle. Sadly, he was wrong. The rifle proved useless, and the tiger mauled him to death before eating him. The tiger that terrified the community was eventually hunted down and shot by authorities. Gary Hoy On July 9, 1993, Canadian lawyer Gary Hoy, a corporate and securities law specialist for the law firm of Holden Day Wilson, was giving a tour of the Toronto Dominion Centre to a group of articling students. In an attempt to demonstrate the strength of the structure's window glass, he slammed himself against the glass, something he had done on previous occasions to visitors, to show the building's glass windows were unbreakable. After the first attempt, as expected, the glass did not break when he hit it, but the second time Hoy tried it, the glass held, but the frame window gave way, causing the entire intact window and Hoy to fall from the building, killing him instantly. Hoy's death contributed to the closing of Holden Day Wilson in 1996, which at the time was the largest law firm closure in Canada. Amina Barami an eye for an eye. Amina Barami, an Iranian student at Azad University in Islam Shah, was being harassed by fellow student Majid Movahedi. She had reported her concerns to the police, but no action was taken. In October 2004, 
Barami was walking home from her job at a medical engineering company when Movahedi attacked her. She attempted to escape, but he blocked her path and threw acid in her face. She subsequently underwent 17 surgeries, but was left badly disfigured and blind in both eyes. At his trial, Barami testified against Movahedi. She informed the court that she desired to inflict the same life on him that he inflicted on her and requested that 20 drops of acid be dropped in his eyes. The punishment is permitted under the Quisis principle of Sharia law and was agreed. The punishment was due to be carried out on April 15, 2009, but did not take place that year. Astonishingly, Mohavedi requested that if he were to be blinded, the authorities should also empty out Barami's eyes to ensure that she could not secretly see. A new punishment date of May 14, 2011 was revealed but again the punishment did not happen and was postponed indefinitely. On July 31st, 2011, it was revealed that Barami had forgiven and pardoned her attacker, stating that she did so for her country. She now lives self-sufficiently in Spain. Jesse Arbogast On July 6th, 2001, eight-year-old Jesse Arbogast from Ocean Springs was enjoying a 4th of July holiday weekend with his family at a beach near Pensacola, Florida. He was swimming in a shallow ocean near Pensacola when a bull shark attacked him. The shark ripped off Jesse's arm as his family watched in horror. Quick thinking by his uncle, Vance, and others helped save Jesse's life. Vance wrestled the shark out of the water and a park ranger shot it and recovered Abogast's arm from the shark's gullet. Jesse was airlifted to the hospital, and doctors managed to reattach the arm during 11 hours of surgery. He made a good recovery, but sadly he lost so much blood, he suffered severe brain damage. We are unsure how he is doing now. Texas State University Freeman Ranch Body Farm This one is pretty gruesome. There's a 28-acre Texas State University ranch which is not your typical farmland. It's a forensic anthropology research facility, more commonly referred to as a body farm. But this isn't a scene from some gruesome mass murder. These bodies are here for science. The facility is a human decomposition research lab where human remains are left outside in the fields or confined to cages to study how the flesh rots from the bones. Some lay unprotected in the scorching sun so researchers can track the effects of scavenging there are dozens of bodies scattered across the ground. Some are complete cadavers, others just a bit of limbs and organs. It currently has around 50 donated bodies. Anthropology students, law enforcement officials, and other researchers study the corpses to enhance their knowledge of human decay. The lab, that has only been open since 2008, has already received 150 donated bodies to be studied, and has a list of over 200 still living people registered to donate their bodies when they die to the facility, offering a cheap alternative to funerary and burial expenses. As macabre as it may seem, the facility is an invaluable resource for the international forensic science community, although when driving past expecting to see some corn or farm animals, bodies laying in fields can be a bit disconcerting. trapped 15,000 feet underwater. On Wednesday, the 29th of August, 1973, Roger Mallinson and Roger Chapman began a routine dive in Pisces 3, a Canadian commercial submersible. Their job was to work on laying transatlantic telephone cables on the seabed, approximately 150 miles southwest of Cork in Southern Ireland. Their eight hour shift passed without incident. However, shortly after 9 a.m., when the submersible was about to be lifted out of the water back onto the ship, a water alarm sounded, and the crew heard the sound of water as Pisces 3 became inverted and began to sink back down to the seabed. Hanging by its rope, the sub jolted to a stop and swung around violently before the line snapped and it hurtled down to the seabed. The noise inside the capsule was intense, and the men stacked cushions around them to break the fall and stuffed rags in their mouth to prevent them from biting through their tongues. At 1,575 foot, the sub crashed to the floor, 
burying its nose in the seabed. They were trapped inside the six-foot diameter steel cabin at a depth twice that of any previous submarine rescue. Using a flashlight, the crew were able to call their mothership to update them on their position. At this point, they had 64 hours of oxygen left. All they could do was wait to be rescued. They knew they had to make as little physical exertion as possible to preserve oxygen, not even speaking. There was no toilet, and they had very little food and water. They needed to operate the scrubber, an electrical filter that cleaned the air of carbon dioxide that their lungs continually breathed out. If that didn't work, they would soon suffocate. Thankfully, the machine worked, but it needed to be activated every 30 minutes. If both men fell asleep and failed to switch it on, there was a good chance neither would wake up. Cramped inside the cabin, the two terrified men trembled with anxiety. There was no immediate escape. All they could do was wait and hope. They knew help was on the way, but would get there in time. The CO2 scrubber meant they ached and had blinding headaches. Mallinson also had an upset stomach, and with no toilet, he had to relieve himself into a bag. The stench made the stuffy conditions even worse. The men huddled together to keep warm, and licked the condensation off of their fingers to quench their thirst. After 50 excruciating hours, rescuers located them, however multiple attempts to secure a rescue line failed. Finally, in the early hours of Saturday morning, nearly 70 hours into the ordeal, a line was secured, but this was not the end of their nightmare. As the sub was moved to start its ascent, both men were hurled against the bulkhead. The plastic bags that had been their portable toilet burst, and they were thrown about like a washing machine. As they were being winched upwards, there was still the fear that the line would snap, sending them back down to the bottom of the ocean. After 76 hours, they finally reached the surface, but they still didn't know if the badly damaged hatch could be opened. After several attempts, a tremendous bang was heard, and the men were free. It was calculated they had just 12 minutes of oxygen left before they would have suffocated. A truly horrendous ordeal. And I wonder if either of these men continued in this line of work. Rudy Valentino's Cursed Ring Rudolf Valentino shot a stardom when he appeared in the 1921 movie The Sheik. Women were reportedly to have fainted in the cinemas when they saw the sex symbol on film. When Rudolf suddenly died at the age of 31, he became an icon of the silver screen. The medical explanation for his death was ruptured ulcers, but could it have really been a cursed ring that was responsible for his premature demise? Supposedly, Rudy found the destiny ring in a San Francisco store, where the shopkeeper was trying to reel Rudy in when he told him of the ring's supernatural connection. Rudy refused to be put off and bought the ring anyway. He wore the tiger's eye ring throughout filming of the young Raja, which incidentally was his one and only flop. After this, he put the ring away for several years, but on wearing it again, he collapsed and soon died from sepsis. After his funeral, which caused a rash of suicides and had thousands of mourners, the ring was chosen by his lover, Paula Negra as a keepsake. The actress fell gravely ill almost immediately. She gave the ring to a young actor named Russ Colombo, who was shot and killed by a friend. The ring was then left to his cousin, Joe Casino, whose car was hit by a truck and he was killed instantly. Joe's brother, Dell, inherited the ring. When he was burgled, the police shot the robber and the ring was found in the dead man's pocket. When Jack Dunn was being considered for the main role in a Valentino biopic, he borrowed the ring for his screen test. You can guess what happened to him. He died from blood poisoning two days later. The tiger's eye was put in a bank vault for safekeeping, and after two robberies and a fire at the bank, the ring went missing. This mysterious, supposedly supernatural cursed ring's whereabouts are currently unknown. The Anhurst Canada Poltergeist. In 1878, at the age of just 17, Esther Cox was brutally attacked and almost raped by a friend of the family. Esther lived in the small town of Anhurst, Nova Scotia in Canada, and shared her home with Olive, 
her sister Olive's husband Daniel Teed and their two small boys. Her other sister Jane and Daniel's brother also lived there, making the house quite a crowded place, especially as some of the rooms were even rented out to strangers for extra income. Sadly for Esther, after her attempted rape, she developed seizures, along with unexplained fevers. It was clear that she was suffering from psychological trauma. Strange phenomena also began to appear around the house at this time. Esther shared a bed with her sister Jane, and one night, Olive and Daniel were disturbed by a deafening scream. They found both Esther and Jane cowering in their bedroom. They were adamant that there was something crawling underneath their blankets. The screaming happened again a second night, when the girls heard something scuttling around beneath a wooden storage box, which spontaneously leapt into the air and landed in the middle of the room when they approached it. On the third night, Esther began to scream and convulse. This was accompanied by loud noises and rattling throughout the house before she fell into a deep sleep. After calling the doctor, things began to get worse. He witnessed a pillow being whipped out from under Esther's head by an unseen force, scraping noises from under the bed, and most sinister of all was the writing that appeared by itself on the wall before his very eyes. It read, Esther Cox, you are mine. The activity escalated, becoming much more dangerous as lit matches fell from the ceiling onto beds. The phenomenon even followed Esther to church, with loud rapping sounds and knocking was heard during mass. Esther moved out to a friend's house, but when the barn burned down, Esther was arrested for arson and served 30 days in prison. After her release, the happening ceased and life returned to normal for Esther. Christian Iacona In the year 2009, Christian Iacona was the mayor of Vence, a commune just north of Nice in southeastern France, when his grandson Gabriel accused him of rape. Gabriel went to his father, Philippe, and told him in great detail what his grandfather had done at his villa in Vence. There was supporting medical evidence of lesions on the young boy's body that suggested he had been sexually violated. Gabriel said the abuse had taken place over two years. From 1996 to 1995, when he was aged six to eight. Over the following years, Gabriel suffered from nightmares, had severe crises and PTSD. He attempted suicide on several occasions, which made his accusations seem all the more credible at the time. Christian was found guilty and sentenced to nine years in prison in 2009. Then in May of 2021, Gabriel, after maintaining the allegation for 11 years, suddenly changed his mind and withdrew the accusation against his grandfather. Gabriel acknowledged that he had been raped, but not by his grandfather. He said, I can still see this scene before me, but I no longer see it as possible. I might have transposed my grandfather onto someone else. Gabriel confessed to having unknowingly lied and had been influenced by tension between his father and grandfather and lied to attract attention. He was convinced by various doctors of the reality of his own lies, but when he had doubts, he didn't dare to formulate them out loud, in front of people who had stood by him through 10 years of investigations. Now aged 21, Gabriel found himself compelled to go on hunger strike to obtain the release of his grandfather, who was 77. He sat outside of the courthouse in the town of Grass, surviving on just orange juice and water, and only ended his protest when he secured a hearing with prosecutors. At a retrial in March of 2015, the conviction was overturned, and Christian was released and able to embrace his grandson outside of the courthouse in Lyon. Death Roll Amelie Osborne Smith from Andover in England was 18 when she went white water rafting on the Zambezi River below the Victoria Falls. She had travelled to Zambia on a gap year with her friends because she wanted to see the world. She was in the water for a quick dip to cool off and was swimming back towards the boat when she felt something pass over her legs. She thought it was her friend, but then realised that her friend was swimming next to her. Amali looked down and was horrified to see that it was actually a crocodile by her feet. The creature clamped onto her leg and began to go into a death roll as it tried to pull her under. She admitted that she lost control, as she couldn't breathe at this point, believing that she was going to die. 
her friend tightly held onto the shoulders of Amali's life jacket while she kicked out of the beast. Eventually, the animal let go, and Amali was dragged back onto the raft. She said the worst part was waiting for 45 minutes whilst losing blood and with no pain relief until the helicopter airlifted her to hospital in Lusaka. Her leg injuries were serious, and she was lucky not to lose her foot. After life-saving surgery, and once stable, she was flown home to a trauma hospital in London, where she underwent a total of seven operations. Amali was given an Act of Courage honour in the awards for Brave Britons 2022, after she had begun fundraising for a village school to be built near the attack site. She said she wanted to give back to the people who had helped her to get medical treatment. Strip Search In April of 2004, a phone call was received at the McDonald's restaurant in Washington, Kentucky. The assistant manager, Donna Summers, answered the call to a policeman named Officer Scott. He provided a description of a thin woman with blonde hair who was suspected of robbery. Donna thought that the description matched that of an 18-year-old employee currently on duty called Louisa Ogden. But the person who called was not an actual policeman. The pretend policeman ordered Donna to search Louise in the restaurant because there were no officers available to handle such a routine manner. Louise was taken into the office and told to strip off her clothes before Donna put them into a bag. Another assistant manager was there to witness the strip search and Louise was told to cover herself with an apron. After an hour, the other assistant manager had to leave so Donna called her own fiancé, Walter Nix Jr., who arrived and followed instructions given over the phone for the next two hours. He removed the apron, ordered Louise to dance naked and perform jumping jacks, as well as other sexual activities. Officer Scott also spoke to Donna and threatened her with punishment if she didn't do as he asked. She later said that she was scared for her life, but did not what to do because she thought she was talking to a real police officer. After two and a half hours in the office, Louise was ordered to perform a sexual act on Jason by Officer Scott. Donna eventually became suspicious and rang her manager, who agreed that the whole thing was a fraud. After three and a half hours, Louise was released. The real police were immediately rang, and Jason was charged with sexual assault. The whole incident was on the office surveillance camera. It turned out that several other strip search scam calls had taken place. The caller was traced, and a married man of four named David Stewart was arrested. He was tried but acquitted because of a lack of direct evidence. Louise was awarded over $1 million in compensation from McDonald's and Donna was also awarded damages because McDonald's knew about the other scams and never warned their managers. Walter Nix Jr. was sentenced to five years imprisonment. Donna broke off their engagement when she saw the CCTV footage. Who killed Cindy James? October 1982 saw the start of a series of bizarre phone calls from the Canadian nurse Cindy James. It was just four months after separating from her husband when the phone harassment began. The calls ranged from complete silence to threats of violence. Cindy's estranged husband, Roy Makepeace, became the prime suspect. Soon the harassment escalated and a window was smashed at her property. The perpetrator entered and slashed her pillow. After reporting the stalking to the police, Cindy began a year-long relationship with the investigating officer, Patrick McBride. He witnessed a silent call himself while Cindy was present. In January 1983, Cindy was found unconscious in her yard with a stocking wrapped around her neck. On waking, Cindy said she had been attacked by two men. A year after the call started, three dead cats were found hanging from trees in Cindy's garden, with a note that read, you're next. Cindy moved home several times and hired a private investigator who found her unconscious at her home with a note pinned to her hand with a knife, which read, now you must die. The attacks went on and on. Her dog was physically abused, more notes were found, and fires were set in her house. But without any evidence, the police believed that Cindy was causing the incident herself in a revenge fantasy against her ex-husband Roy. In June 1989, Cindy, aged 44, vanished. Her body was found two weeks later in the yard of an abandoned house. She was beaten, drugged, hogtied, and strangled with a nylon stocking. 
In all, Cindy had reported almost 100 incidents of harassment, but the police were adamant that she had committed suicide. The inquest ruled that she died from an unknown event. The Howden Moor Incident In March 1997, just after 10pm, the Ecclesfield Police Station was inundated with emergency calls. People from the isolated village of Bolsterstone, high up on the moors between Sheffield, England, and the Peak National Park, were ringing in to report a crashed airplane. Two farmers rang first, who saw the plane flying low and come down in a flash. Others reported an explosion and a strange orange glow on the western horizon. Around 40 police, fire and rescue and ambulance services were put on alert. By 11pm, the police and RAF helicopters reached the site, but could find nothing on thermal imaging. Although a sonic boom was reported as coming from the area at the time of the reported crash. By early morning, 141 mountain rescue volunteers were up on the moor, searching the dangerous terrain, on foot, along with police officers and dog teams. But the crash could have occurred anywhere in the 50 square mile radius of the wild and hostile terrain. Reports of the sighting kept coming in from reliable witnesses, including a special constable, but still no wreckage was found. With no reports of unreturned flights from anywhere in the area, the search was scaled back. To this very day, no explanation for the event has ever been found. So what crashed, and where did it go? The Chillenden Murders Dr. Lynn Russell picked up her two daughters, Josie age 9 and Megan 6 from school on Tuesday the 9th of July 1996 after their swimming gala. It was a lovely day for a walk home and the family had their pet dog Lucy with them. About 20 minutes in, they reached a narrow track named Cherry Garden Lane which is near to the small village of Chillenden near Cantonbury in Kent, England. A car drove past them and Josie waved at the driver. As they got further down the track, that same car was blocking their way. A man got out of the vehicle, he was brandishing a hammer. He demanded money from Lynn, but she had left her purse at home and wasn't carrying any cash. Lynn told Josie to run for help, but the man grabbed her and hit her over the head with the hammer. He then marched the family into the nearby trees and tied them up using strips of Josie's swimming towel, a pair of tights and a boot lace. He then launched a sickening attack on all three victims, including the dog Lucy. Remarkably, Josie survived the attack and was still alive, albeit with a very weak pulse, when a search party found the three bodies. Josie was rushed to hospital in London, where after extensive surgery, miraculously she pulled through and was able to give a description of the monster who had attacked them. A man named Michael Stone was arrested a year later and found guilty of the murders at the trial and again in retrial. He was sentenced to life in prison, but continues to protest his innocence. The notorious serial killer, Levy Belfield, has also been linked to the crimes, but no evidence has come forward. A truly sickening story. Superfan Monica Sellers was born in the former Yugoslavia and began to play tennis at the age of five. She turned professional at the age of just 14, and finished her first full-time tour ranked number six in the world. From 1991 to 1992, she dominated women's tennis and became the youngest woman ever to win the French Open by beating Steffi Graf in the final. The problem was, Steffi had an obsessive German superfan named Gunther Parch, who was not happy that his idol had lost her number one spot. In April 1991, during a quarter-final match, Monica was playing against Magdalena Maliva in Hamburg, Germany. During a changeover, Monica was sitting at courtside when Gunther ran out of the center of the crowd to the edge of the court. He leaned over the fence and stabbed Monica between the shoulder blades with a boning knife. Monica was quickly taken to hospital with a one and a half inch wound in her back. Gunther was arrested and found to be mentally unbalanced. He said he only wanted to hurt Monica, not kill her, but admitted wanting to injure her badly enough that she couldn't play, and Steffi would become number one again. In a controversial move, a German court gave him a two-year suspended sentence for grievous bodily harm. Monica was angered by the leniency of the ruling, 
and prosecutors were able to win the right for a retrial, but the suspended sentence was upheld. Monica did lose her ranking because she did not play professionally for another two years and was left with deep emotional trauma because of the attack. The Perfect Family Man John List was a bank executive and a Sunday school teacher. He lived in a beautiful house in New Jersey with his wife and three children. He seemed to have the perfect life, but what people did not know was that beneath the perfect exterior, List was a cold man with few friends and a lack of basic social skills, which meant he was often fired from jobs. For weeks, List had been leaving his home every morning and pretending to go to work. Actually, he was going to the train station to spend all day reading but the bills were not being paid and the foreclosure process had begun on the mortgage. So List had to act quickly before his lie was discovered. On November 9th, 1971, while the children were still at school, List shot his wife, Helen, 46, and his own mother, Alma, 84. When his eldest child, Patricia, 16, and younger son, Frederick, 13, came home for lunch, he shot them both in the back of the head. After enjoying his own midday snack, he drove to his bank to close his mother's account, as well as his own. Then he went to watch his eldest son John, 15, play in a soccer match at Westfield High School. After driving young John home, List found that he had to shoot him several times because his son was trying to defend himself. List placed the bodies in sleeping bags in the ballroom. He left a letter for his pastor to explain he had killed his family to save their souls because there was too much evil in the world. He cleaned up, and taking any photographs of himself, he left. It was a month before the bodies were found, and almost 18 years before List was finally captured. He had moved to Denver, changed his name, and remarried. He was given five life sentences, and died in prison in 2008, age 82. Weighted Down With Iron Shoes On July 11th, 1994, police recovered the body of a man from the sea off North Sea Island near Germany. He was found wearing a tie with a club design, navy French made trousers, a light blue shirt and handmade luxury loafers. The immaculately dressed man was nicknamed the gentleman. He had suffered violent blows to his head and upper body and it was determined he was British. Also attached to his body were a pair of iron shoe molds the same size as his own. Chillingly, the shoe molds had been attached to weigh the body down. Despite numerous appeals, no one ever identified the man. Thirty years later, his body was exhumed and DNA extracted to try and identify the gentleman. And in 2022, a new appeal for information, along with a reconstruction, was released. To date, the man's identity and the story around the Iron Souls is a mystery. horrific neglect by parents. Lacey Fletcher suffered from locked-in syndrome, a rare neurological disorder characterized by complete paralysis of voluntary muscles, except for those that controlled her eyes. Lacey relied completely on her parents, Sheila and Clay, for her care. However, when police arrived at the Fletcher's home in January 2022, after her parents called 911, they were confronted with the most ghastly scene. 36-year-old Lacey was found dead, fused to a living room couch, covered from head to toe in urine, liquid feces, and insect bites, with live bugs and rodent excrement nearby in the otherwise tidy home in Louisiana. It's hard to believe Lacey's outwardly respectable parents could neglect their daughter in such a way, and they are rightly now facing murder charges. Lacey was last seen in public outside of her family home 15 years ago. What happened between then and now inside the home is currently under investigation. The Silent Twins' Deadly Bond June and Jennifer Gibbons were identical twins born to Caribbean parents in 1963. The family moved to Britain from Barbados as part of the Windrush generation and eventually settled in Haverford, West Wales. The twin sisters were inseparable and their language, a sped up Bajan Creole, made it difficult for people to understand them. The twins were bullied at school, and the trauma caused their language to become even more peculiar, until eventually it was unintelligible to others, 
and eventually they spoke to no one except each other and their younger sister Rose. The twins were sent to separate boarding schools, but soon became catatonic and entirely withdrawn when parted. Reunited in their teenage years, the twins began using drugs and alcohol, and after committing a series of crimes in 1981, they were admitted to Broadmoor Hospital and sentenced to infinite detention under the Mental Health Act. They remained at Broadmoor for 11 years. During their stay at Broadmoor, they began to believe that it was necessary for one of them to die, for the other one to live a normal life, and after much discussion, Jennifer agreed to make the sacrifice. In March 1993, the twins were transferred from Broadmoor to a more open clinic in Wales. On arrival, Jennifer could not be roused, and after being taken to hospital, she died. There was no evidence of drugs or poison in her system, and her death remains a mystery. After Jennifer's death, June started living quietly and independently near her parents in West Wales, where she remains to this day. The twin story also inspired the 1998 Manic Street Preacher song, Tsunami, which unfortunately due to copyright we cannot play, but it's worth a listen to. Maddie Clifton When eight-year-old Maddie Clifton disappeared from her home on November 3rd, 1998, an entire town sprang into action to try and find her and hundreds of volunteers joined the search parties. Seven days later, Melissa Phillips, the Clifton's neighbor, was cleaning her 14-year-old son's Josh's room and noticed his waterbed was leaking. But as she looked closer, she realized it wasn't water, it was fluid from Maddie's body. Josh Phillips confessed to the murder, saying he had struck Maddie in the face while playing baseball with her, then accidentally killed her when he hit her with a bat to stop her from crying. But Phillips' account was only half the story. The truth was far darker. After beating her, Josh stabbed her to death with a utility knife, and most disturbing of all, he then slept above Maddie Clifton's rotting corpse for an entire week, while joining in her search with his family. The Girl in the Box On the 15th of September 1981, 10-year-old Ursula Hermann headed home by bike from her cousin's house to her home in Etching, Germany, but she never returned. Her frantic family knew something was wrong and started searching for Ursula in a nearby forest. Police were called and eventually Ursula's red bike was found. 36 hours after her disappearance, the phone rang at the Hermann house. When Ursula's parents picked up, there was silence, followed by a short, familiar jingle, which they recognized from the Bayern 3 radio station. Three more similar calls followed. Then came a ransom note demanding 2 million Deutschmarks, or 450,000 pounds. The family, who were not wealthy, raised the money with the help of neighbors and the state, and awaited further instructions, but they heard nothing. Two weeks passed, and the police decided to search the forest again. In a tiny glade, they discovered a bolted box. Inside was the cold, lifeless body of Ursula. It appeared that the kidnappers had planned to keep Ursula alive, the box was fitted with a shelf and a seat that doubled as a toilet and was stocked with water, cans and snacks, as well as books, a radio and comics. To enable Ursula to breathe, the box had a ventilation system made from plastic plowing pipes which extended to ground level, but whoever designed it had failed to realize that without a machine to circulate the air, the oxygen would quickly run out, which is exactly what happened. frozen. In February of 2012, two snowmobilers came across a car in Sweden's icy northeast. After digging the car out, they found a man in the back seat. The man was pulled out alive. He was emaciated, unable to move, and could barely speak. He was identified as 44-year-old Peter Skalberg, who claimed he had driven off the main road on December 19, 2011, onto forest tracks where his car became stuck. Peter had been in the car for 60 days, living off just snow, in temperatures that fell as low as minus 30 degrees Celsius. Many didn't believe his story, but experts backed it up, saying it was possible his body went into hibernation while he was in the car, in what they have described as the case of a lifetime. Lost Boy Larry On August 12, 1973, a search was called off for a seven-year-old boy named Larry, 
who claimed to be lost in the New Mexico mountains. Five days earlier, CB operators in the southwestern states of New Mexico, Arizona, and California began receiving some very strange transmissions from a sobbing child who called himself Larry. He said he was speaking from the inside of an overturned pickup truck and that his dad, who lay beside him, might be dead from a heart attack. Hundreds of people as well as military search teams began searching in New Mexico's central mountains. At one point, Larry told an Albuquerque radio operator that he could see aeroplane searchlights that had flown over the mountains. However, after searching extensively for five days, radio contact was lost and the search was called off. The authorities quickly wrote the whole thing off to a hoax, but was it really? Those who heard Harry's desperate call for help over CB radio believe it was real. And to this day, no one knows for sure. Could it be that he was a real missing boy abandoned to die in the New Mexico mountains? All that we know is that no trace of him has ever been found, at least not yet. Terror 30 meters below. On May 26, 2013, a tugboat capsized off the coast of Nigeria. It sank 30 meters to the seabed, taking all 12 crew members with it. However, the cook, Harrison O'Keen, managed to scramble to a room which had enough air to keep him alive, and he rigged a single platform to keep his body partially above water and delay hypothermia. Left all alone in the dark, all O'Keen could do was pray. For almost two and a half days, Harrison was trapped when he spotted a light. A team of divers had come to inspect the vessel and retrieve the bodies. This is the moment Harrison reached out to one of those shocked divers. A careful rescue operation was mounted and Harrison lost consciousness, but managed to survive. He spent two days in a decompression chamber and suffered from peeling skin, reoccurring nightmares, and insatiable hunger, but was otherwise in good health. Sadly, all of his 11 crewmates died in the accident. The Reincarnation of Shanti Devi Shanti Devi was born in Delhi, India in 1926. Soon after her fourth birthday, she started talking about a past life and told her parents her real name, her real home was in Manthura. When she started school, she told a teacher that she was married and had died 10 days after giving birth to a child. Speaking in Mathura dialect, she said her husband's name was Kedar Nath. The headmaster of her school located a merchant by that name in Mathura who had lost his wife, Lagdi Devi, nine years earlier, 10 days after giving birth to her son. Kedar Nath was contacted and traveled to Delhi to meet Shanti Devi. She immediately recognized him and his son and conveyed several details of their life together. He was soon convinced that Shanti Devi was indeed the reincarnation of his dead wife, Lagdi Devi. The case was brought to the attention of Mahatma Gandhi, who arranged for Shanti Devi to travel to Mathura. When she arrived on the 15th of November 1935, Shanti recognized several family members, including the grandfather of Lagdi Devi. However, she was dismayed that Kedar had not kept his deathbed promise not to marry again. A report published in 1936 concluded that Shanti Devi was indeed the reincarnation of Legdi Devi. Shanti did not marry and died on the 27th of December 1987, still convinced she was Legdi Devi in a former life. What's your thoughts on reincarnation? Lawrence Singleton in September 1978, 15-year-old Mary Vincent was hitchhiking to get to her grandpa's house in California when a blue van pulled up and offered her a ride. Mary was tired and even though alarm bells rang, she just wanted to get off her feet, so accepted the lift. As the drive went on, Mary fell asleep, but when she awoke, she realized that they were in Nevada, not California. Mary panicked, but the man assured her it was an honest mistake. Later, the man stopped, beat, and raped Mary, and threw her outside of his van. He then cut off both her arms with a hatchet, and pushed an unconscious Mary into a concrete pipe, and left her to die just off of Interstate 5 in Del Porto Canyon. Mary woke up, and walked for three miles, covered in blood and armless. 
before finding and alerting a passing couple who took her to a hospital. Miraculously, she survived and was able to identify her attacker as Lawrence Singleton and testify against him. Singleton received 14 years for the attack on Mary, but was released after eight and went on to murder mother of three Roxanne Hayes in 1997. Mary now lives her life with prosthetics. Beware of the bear. Camping and outdoor life is often a fun adventure. However, for husband and wife, Jacqueline Perry and Mark Jordan, it turned into the ultimate nightmare. In 2005, the couple were camping at a provincial park in Northern Ontario when they were both attacked by a black bear. As the bear tried to carry Jacqueline into the woods, Mark managed to stop it by stabbing the creature several times with his Swiss army knife. He then carried his mauled wife to their kayak and started paddling to the nearest campsite yelling for help. A boat with a doctor on board came to the rescue and desperately tried to treat Jacqueline, but ultimately she succumbed to her injuries. Although it's a rare occurrence, if you are camping or trekking in an area where bears live and they are hungry or with young, beware as there is always a chance of such an attack. Left for dead in a sewer. On February 23rd, 2002, 19 year old Maria Virachevo had just had a furious row with her boyfriend. She was three months pregnant at the time and visibly upset. Alexander Pishuskin approached her and pretended to comfort her and persuaded her to go with him into the park. As they walked, Maria felt assured when she realized he lived close to her, but as they approached an open sewage well, Alexander grabbed Maria's hair and started banging her head against the iron well cover. At this moment, she knew he was going to kill her, so she let herself fall into the 25-foot sewer well. She somehow managed to sit up amongst the choking sewage that was sweeping her away, and many hours later managed to lift a manhole cover and scream for help. Maria was taken to hospital and recovered from her ordeal, but when she gave a policeman her attacker's name and address, he didn't believe her. Alexander Pishuskin was a serial killer who was later convicted of killing over 49 people. He became known as the chessboard killer, as his gruesome target had been 64, the number of squares on a chessboard. Many lives could have been saved if the police had believed Maria that day. Dead animals in the walls. Doing home renovations can be quite stressful, especially if you are living in the house at the same time. But for a family in Pennsylvania, what they discovered during renovations was truly unsettling. The Bretzowitz family from Auburn decided to update the insulation of the home they bought in 2011. But as the work commenced, they discovered lurking behind the walls, dozens of dead animals carefully wrapped in newspaper, along with half used spices and other items. The newspapers dated back to the 1930s and 40s. This disgusting find was not picked up on the survey when they bought the house in 2011, and for over a decade they'd been living with the animal corpses, and they still aren't sure if there are more buried deep in the wall cavities. The dead animals were sent to an expert who believed that the former homeowner was likely practicing Dutch magic and used this process to heal ailments in something referred to as powwowing. The Terror of Operation Wandering Soul Operation Wandering Soul was a creepy USA propaganda experiment orchestrated to frighten the superstitious instincts of Viet Cong during the Vietnam War. Its intention was to manipulate the Vietnamese fear of ghosts ingrained culturally from a belief of wandering souls in the event a decreased individual isn't properly appeased in burial. This is the type of recording that echoed through the jungle during the Vietnam War. As if war wasn't terrifying enough for them, just imagine that. Kennedy Ife This is the sad, horrific story of Kennedy Ife, whose family mistook his mental illness for being possessed by evil spirits. On August 19, 2016, 26-year-old Kennedy Ife, who lived with his family in Enfield, North London, became aggressive 
bit his father and threatened to cut off his own penis. The deeply religious family feared he had been possessed by evil spirits, and rather than calling a doctor, they sought help from the church and attempted to cure Kennedy through restraint and prayer, and members of the family used overwhelming force to calm Kennedy. However, when Kennedy became very unwell, his brother called 999, but when paramedics arrived, they were unable to save him, and he was pronounced dead. The postmortem revealed more than 60 injuries on Kennedy's body, including a possible bite. Seven members of his family were charged with manslaughter, false imprisonment, and causing or allowing the death of a venerable adult. All seven of them were eventually acquitted. It's sad that their misguided religious beliefs caused the death of a much-loved family member. Don't mess with a proton beam. In 1978, Anatoly Bogorsky, a researcher at the Institute for High Energy Physics in Russia, was fixing a malfunction on the largest particle accelerator in the Soviet Union, the U-70 synchrotron. It was a fairly routine procedure, but it went horribly wrong. As Anatoly leaned over the equipment, the safety mechanism failed, and he found himself in the path of the 76 Gev proton beam. The beam passed through the back of his head, the occipital and temporal lobes of his brain, and left middle ear, and out through the left hand side of his nose. The exposed parts of his head received a local dose of 200,000 to 300,000 rogens. Reportedly, he saw a flash brighter than a thousand suns, but did not feel any pain. Immediately, Anatoly understood the severity of what had happened, but continued working until his face swelled to beyond recognition, and he was rushed to hospital, where he wasn't expected to survive, as it was believed that he had received far in excess of a fatal dose of radiation. Over the next few days, his skin started to peel, revealing the path that the proton beam had burned through parts of his face, his bone, and the brain tissue underneath. Remarkably, he did survive and carried on working, despite some lasting effects of the exposure. Cutting off your arms to survive. In late April 2003, Aaron Ralston went on a solo hike in Utah's Blue John Canyon, but as he made his way down a narrow canyon wall, he dislodged an 800 pound boulder that pinned him down by his arm. For five days he was stuck, and his food and water had run out. The only way he could survive was by cutting off his arm to free himself. With no other option, Aaron broke his arm, before using his blunt multi-tool to cut off the limb. In the process, he lost one-fourth of his blood. He then hiked out of the canyon, climbed down a 65-foot cliff, and walked a further six miles to get help. Miraculously, he survived the ordeal, and went on to live a full life missing half an arm. Aaron's remarkable bravery and will to live is documented in his book Between a Rock and a Hard Place and the 2010 movie 127 Hours, which is well worth a watch. The Mystery of the Enfield Monster In 1973, the residents of Enfield, Illinois, reported seeing an unknown creature. Eyewitnesses said it was about 4 foot 4 inches tall, with three legs, grey fur, huge pink eyes and two arms attached to the front of its body. Some said it resembled a monkey, and at least one witness believed it was humanoid in appearance. The creature apparently had impressive speed and agility, and it screeched like a wildcat. Henry McDaniel, the first person to report the creature, told how it was scratching outside his house, and when he investigated, he found himself face to face with the monster. McDaniel ran to get his gun, and out of fear, fired several times at the creature, causing it to run off. When the police arrived, they found unusual footprints with six toe pads, along with some odd scratch marks on the house. As more reports came in, police ended up investigating many more sightings. People became so convinced of the creature's existence that fear enveloped the usually quiet town. Theories ranged from an escaped kangaroo, to aliens, or a failed genetic experiment. To date, the creature's identity has never been established, and there are still some who live in fear of the return of the Enfield monster. The Watcher House In June 2014, Derek and Maria Brothers were excited to move into their dream house at 657 Boulevard in Westfield, New Jersey. 
But as the couple prepared to settle into the $1.3 million house with their three children, they started to receive a series of disturbing letters in the mail that were signed The Watcher. The content of the letters seemed to indicate someone was watching their every move, and they were unhappy with the changes being made to the house. Over the course of a few weeks, the letters got more sinister and threatening, until eventually Derek Broaddus called the police. He also contacted the former owners, who confirmed that they too had had the odd letters from the watcher. DNA found on the envelope indicated that a woman had sealed them with her saliva. The family became so desperate that they reached out to the real-life FBI agent who inspired the character of Clarice Starling in Silence of the Lambs, but no one could figure out who or why they were receiving the letters. After six months, Derek and Maria had had enough and put the house on the market. But when it didn't sell, the Broadduses made an application to pull the house down and redevelop the plot, but it was rejected. This is one of the last letters they received. Maybe a car accident, maybe a fire. Maybe something as simple as a mild illness that never seems to go away, but makes you feel sick day after day after day. Maybe the mysterious death of a pet, loved ones suddenly die, planes and cars and bicycle crash, bones break. You wonder who the watcher is, Turn around, idiots. After years on the market, the Watcher House finally sold in 2019, with the Broadduses taking a $440,000 loss. There was a silver lining for the family, however, as Netflix bought the rights to their creepy tale in 2019 and are due to release it in 2022. The Tucker Telephone Torture Device the Tucker Telephone was a modern-day torture device invented in Arkansas to use on the Tucker State Prison farm inmates. The device consisted of an old-fashioned telephone wired in sequence with two batteries. The electrodes coming from it were attached to a prisoner's big toe and genitals, and when the telephone was cranked, it sent a powerful electric shock through the prisoner's body. If a prisoner were to be severely punished, they would receive a long-distance call that sent a series of electric shocks in a row. In addition to the Tucker telephone, inmates within the Arkansas prison system were punished with beatings, whippings, torture with pliers, and needles put under their fingernails. The 1980 movie Brew Baker, which is loosely based on events in Arkansas's prisons, depicts an inmate named Abram being tortured with the Tucker telephone. Survival On January 26, 1972, Flight attendant Vesna Volovic boarded JAT Flight 367 with her colleagues en route to Belgrade. Vesna was not supposed to be on the flight, but she agreed to work after a mix-up with the rotor. The flight departed at 3.15pm, and less than an hour later, an explosion tore through the plane's baggage compartment. The explosion caused the aircraft to break apart over the Czechoslovak village of Subsur Kamenc. The passengers fell from 33,330 feet, a fall that took three minutes. 27 passengers and crew were killed, except for Vesna. She was discovered by a German man who heard her screaming amid the wreckage, and he was able to keep her alive until rescuers arrived. It was later discovered there was a bomb in the hold placed there by terrorist group Ustashi. Vesna had a broken skull, three crushed vertebra, and two broken legs and woke up three days after the crash, not remembering a thing. She made an almost complete recovery, and still holds the world record for surviving the highest fall without a parachute. Haunted Wine Cabinet Box The Dibuk Box is a notorious wine cabinet said to be haunted by a Dibuk, a malicious possessed spirit believed to be the dislocated soul of a dead person according to Jewish mythology. The cabinet was originally auctioned on eBay by Kevin Manis, who told the story of a Jewish Holocaust survivor who previously owned the box, who told him it contained the malicious spirit of a Dibuk, and that the item had paranormal powers and was responsible for his bad luck and nightmares. Subsequent owners of the box told similar stories with their own claims of strange phenomena, and one of its owners sold the rights to the story of a Hollywood production company and was the inspiration for the film The Possession. The box was later gifted to Ghost Adventures star Zach Bagans to display in his museum, and in 2018, the rapper Post Malone claimed a spat of bad luck was caused by his contact with the cabinet. 
In a twist to the story, in 2021, Kevin Manis claimed he made the whole thing up as a creative project. Nightmare Climb in 1985, climbers Joe Simpson and Simon Yates were climbing the Seula Grande mountain in Peru. As they neared the summit, Joe fell and broke his leg, and Simon was left with the task of getting his severely injured partner back down the mountain. Simon lowered Joe 300 feet at a time, when suddenly he started to slip. Simon felt the rope go taut, and knew Joe had gone over the drop. Simon believed he'd lost his friend, and when the snow he was sitting on began to move, he knew he had no choice but to cut the rope. Simon believed his friend must be dead and made his way down the mountain back to the campsite. However, Joe had landed on a ledge and was able to crawl to safety. Three days later, Joe arrived at the camp, dehydrated and starving. He had lost 42 pounds in three days, but miraculously was alive and Simon nursed his friend back to full health. Joe Simpson told his story in the book, Touching the Void. Adolfo de Jesus Constanzo As a teenager, Adolfo de Jesus Constanzo began to practice a religion called Palo Mayombi, which involves animal sacrifice. He continued the practice into adulthood and moved to Mexico City where he began a profitable business, casting spells to bring good luck, which involved expensive ritual sacrifices of chickens, goats, snakes, zebras, and even lion cubs. Many of his clients were rich, powerful members of Mexican society, including high-ranking corrupt policemen and powerful drug cartels. However, to boost his powers, Constanzo moved from animal sacrifice to humans and started raiding graveyards for human bones to put in his cauldron. His followers believed that the spirits of dead humans were more powerful than animals, and soon he moved on to live human sacrifices. In total, he killed at least 20 victims, whose mutilated bodies were found in and around Mexico City. The process escalated further when Constanzo decided that he needed the power of a brain from an American student, culminating with the 1989 murder of Mark Kilroy. Constanzo also believed his magic was responsible for the success of the cartels, and demanded to become a full business partner with one of the most powerful families he knew, the Calzadas. When his demand was rejected, seven Caldaza's family members disappeared. Their bodies turned up later with fingers, toes, ears, brains, and in one case, the spine missing. Eventually, some of Constanzo's followers were convicted with a range of crimes, including murder. But Constanzo and four of his followers fled, and when he mistakenly thought the police had found him, he ordered one of his followers to shoot him. We'll finish up with the cursed Harlow House. High in the hills above Los Angeles, nestled in the trees of Benedict Canyon, is the former home of iconic 1930s movie actress Jean Harlow. In 1932, Harlow moved into the home with her new husband, Paul Byrne, but less than two months later, he shot himself in the head while standing in front of a mirror. There was much speculation at the time that Byrne was murdered by his ex-girlfriend, Dorothy Millette, who had visited him on the day of his death. This superstition was exacerbated when Dorothy jumped off a boat to her death just two days after Byrne's suicide. Jean moved out of the house after her husband's death, but died just a few years later at the age of 26 from kidney failure. In 1963, celebrity hairstylist Jay Sebring bought the home and lived there with his girlfriend Sharon Tate until she left him for Roman Polanski. But the two remained friends until both of them were murdered by the Charles Manson cult Tate was the same age as Harlow when she passed. Reportedly, when Tate lived at the house, she told friends of several creepy occurrences, including the apparition of a creepy little man who she believed was Paul Byrne's ghost. Many believe the house is both cursed and haunted by the ghosts of both Byrne and Harlow. What do you think? The Disappearance of Ben McDaniel 30-year-old Ben often went diving alone at the cave in Vortex Spring, Florida. In August 2010, he vanished. Specialist recovery divers thoroughly searched the cave, but they found no evidence of Ben. No body, no marks on the cave walls, no activity by aquatic scavengers, or any other evidence. 
There were many theories as to what happened, as Ben had had some recent setbacks in his life. He had most recently lost his younger brother. Was it possible that he committed suicide and squeezed himself into an inaccessible part of the cave so his body wouldn't be found? A private investigator who was hired by the family thought that Ben was killed on land and that the diving accident had been used to cover up a crime. Especially after the owner of Vortex Spring also died in mysterious circumstances. Arthur's Seat Doll A group of boys were chasing rabbits in Edinburgh in 1836. They found something spooky in a cave on Arthur's seat. There were 17 little coffins, each containing a tiny wooden doll, lying under three slate slabs. The dolls were intricately carved, and each wore a different handmade outfit. Why they were made, and who made them, remains a mystery to this day. Perhaps they were effigies made by witches, or possible protective charms placed there by sailors, who believed that their wives could bury their image if they were lost at sea. Or were they put there to honour the 17 victims of the notorious body snatchers Burke and Hare? It seems unlikely, as 12 of their victims were women, and the little dolls are all dressed as men. The dolls are currently on display at the National Museum of Scotland, and their origin is still a mystery. Baby Abduction It's every parent's worst nightmare, the kidnapping of a child. While this family's nanny of an 11-year-old child faked her own pregnancy by holding a baby shower and wearing a fake belly, then she got her cousin to sneak into her employee's house in Auckland, New Zealand, and take the child so that she could pretend it was hers. All of this was captured on CCTV. Now watch how the woman sneaks into the house wearing a balaclava and snatches the baby. Luckily, police found the culprits, and the baby was returned to her parents, after what must have been the most frightening eight hours of their lives. The nanny was charged with kidnapping, criminal harassment, and burglary and was jailed for three years. The Angel of Death, Beverly Allett. Beverly Allett, or the Angel of Death as she became known, is one of Britain's most notorious female serial killers. Her crimes were all the more shocking as she was a nurse and befriended the parents of her victims before and after she took their young lives. From an early age, Alet, who was born in Grantham, England, showed signs of an attention disorder that included wearing dressings and casts over imaginary wounds. She also spent a considerable amount of time in hospital seeking medical attention for a string of false physical ailments. As an adult, she struggled with her weight and became increasingly attention-seeking. She was also known to self-harm and was later diagnosed with the attention disorder Munchausen syndrome by proxy. However, despite her obvious problems, she went on to train as a nurse and secured a temporary six-month contract at the Grantham and Kesteven Hospital in 1991, where she began work on Children's Ward 4. The hospital was chronically understaffed, so Alet was often left alone with the young patients. Not long after she started working at the hospital, Seven-month-old Liam Taylor, who was admitted with a respiratory disorder, unexpectedly suffered cardiac arrest and died. Two weeks later, 11-year-old Timothy Hardwick also died, followed by two-month-old twin Becky Phillips. None of these children had been admitted with life-threatening ailments. In between these deaths, several other babies and young children had unexpected life-threatening medical episodes. The one thing all these patients had in common was that nurse Beverly Allett was in attendance, although initially no suspicion fell on her. However, her atrocious crimes were brought to an end with the death of 15-month-old Claire Peck, when tests revealed a high level of potassium in the baby's blood, as well as traces of lignocaine. Police were called to investigate, and the other suspicious cases were also looked into and they found that inordinately high doses of insulin were found in most. In total, 13 victims were identified, four of whom were dead. The only common factor was the presence of Beverly Allett at every episode. In May 1993, 
Alex was found guilty of murdering four children, attempting to murder three others, and causing grievous bodily harm to a further six. She received 13 life sentences for her crimes, and is currently detained at Rampton Secure Hospital in Nottinghamshire, with little chance of ever being released. The Look of Hatred Joseph Goebbels was the Nazi propaganda minister. He was one of Adolf Hitler's closest and most devoted followers, and in a good mood at the League of Nations meeting in Geneva, Switzerland, in 1933. Life magazine photographer Alfred Eiselstedt was able to capture him relaxed and smiling at one point. But then Goebbels realised that the photographer was in fact a German-born Jew. His whole demeanour changed, his posture became stiff, and there was a palpable expression of hate on his face. The day after Hitler shot himself in 1945, Goebbels had his six children injected with morphine and then poisoned with cyanide capsules before he and his wife committed suicide. Years later, Albert spoke out about the photograph and how Goebbels looked up at him with an expression full of hate. BTK Strangler For 30 years, Boy Scout troop leader and church council president Dennis Rader fooled the world and his family into believing he was a respectable working man. But in reality, he had harboured vicious, murderous, sadistic thoughts since he was a teenager, and between 1974 and 1991, he killed and tortured 10 people in and around Wichita, Kansas. His first four victims were killed in one night when he broke into the home of the Atiro family, murdering Joseph and Julie and their two children aged 9 and 11. Over the next 17 years, Raider murdered another six people, pausing only briefly when his wife gave birth to their two children. During this time, he taunted the police by sending them letters signed BTK. He also kept gruesome mementos of his victims and photos of himself dressed in their underwear reenacting how he killed them. However, eventually the letters he was sending were his downfall, when he sent one in floppy disk form, and through DNA, police were able to track it back to him. Rader was arrested on February 25th, 2005, and fully confessed to all 10 murders. Chillingly, he said to the police, there are a lot of lucky people, meaning that he had fully intended on killing more. The BTK killer was sentenced to 175 years in jail, without the possibility of parole. Now aged 77, he is currently incarcerated at El Dorado Correctional Facility. Namku Terrace Haunting. This abandoned building in Hong Kong was used in World War II by Japanese soldiers to house comfort women who were local girls forced to be sex slaves. The girls were said to frequently disappear without a trace. Apparently, as many as 30 suicides have happened at the location, and many bodies have been removed from the rooms and garden. The bloody ghosts of decapitated women have been seen, and screaming is often heard. In 2003, eight teenage girls spent the night there with an Ouija board. One of the girls supposedly became possessed, and was unable to leave as the others fled. The police were called, and had to restrain the girl, who was said to have become so violent that it took two officers to control her. She and two other girls became so unhinged that they had to be taken for psychiatric treatment. TJ Lane's Shirt In February 2012, 17-year-old Thomas Michael TJ Lane used a pistol to kill three students and wound another two at Chardon High School in Ohio. He was captured and tried as an adult. He pleaded guilty to the charges against him of three counts of aggravated murder, two counts of attempted murder, and one count of felonious assault. At the hearing, he removed his shirt to reveal a white tee with the word killer written across it. He then callously looked towards the victim's families and taunted them. He was sentenced to life without parole and only avoided the death penalty because he was 17 at the time of the murders. In 2004, he escaped from prison with another inmate, but he was quickly found hiding in a nearby woods. He is now housed in a maximum security prison. 
where he will hopefully stay for the rest of his life. The Abba Fan Disaster On the morning of October 21st, 1966, the small Welsh mining village of Abba Fan had seen three weeks of unprecedented rainfall. The spoil tip for the mine was on the mountainside above the village. The nearby colliery had run out of tipping space in the valley floor 50 years earlier, so seven tips were built on the hillside overlooking the village. At 9.15am, with a booming roar, 150,000 cubic meters of slurry began to slide down the mountain in an avalanche that engulfed and obliterated a farm, 20 houses, and Pentglass Junior School. A mound of debris to a height of 9 meters covered the area. In total, 116 children and 28 adults were killed, and it was, and still is, the worst mining disaster in British history. The Heart of Auguste Delagrange In 2010, a strange item went up for auction on eBay. It was claimed to be the heart of a vampire, who was put down in 1912. It is said that Della Grange was responsible for the deaths of over 40 people in Louisiana during one of the USA's worst outbreaks of vampirism. After a bizarre spat of murders where the victims were found exsanguinated, two priests decided to investigate. The first was Catholic Father Henry Jant, the second was Moses Amashan from the voodoo religion. They hunted the killer and destroyed many of his minions along the way. Eventually, the two men found Delagrange, hidden deep in the Bujou, in an isolated shack. Finding him asleep, John drove a stake through his heart and sent him to hell. His body was destroyed, but his heart and the stake that killed him supposedly still remain. The Kansas City Butcher Robert Bedella was born on January 31, 1949, in Sawyerhoga Falls, Ohio. He had an unhappy childhood, and by the time he reached adolescence, he realized he was gay. In 1965, Bedella watched the film adaptation of the John Fowles novel The Collector. The plot of the movie revolves around a man abducting a young woman and holding her cap in his windowless basement, where eventually the woman dies. The film had a deep impact on Bedella and influenced how he treated his victims. Bedella's first victim was 19-year-old Jerry Howell, who he abducted on July 5th, 1984. He held Jerry in his home in 4315 Charlotte Street, Kansas City, Missouri, and subjected the young man to sickening torture and abuse until he died. Bedella then dragged his body to the basement, where he suspended it above a large cooking pot, making cuts in the flesh to allow the blood to drain from his corpse. The next day, he dismembered Howell's body and threw the bits out in the trash. This was a theme that continued with Burdella's next five victims, although the brutality of the abuse and length of captivity before death increased. Bardella was finally arrested after his last victim escaped, after three days of being held captive. When he managed to escape through a second floor window, wearing nothing except a dog collar around his neck, Police later searched Bardella's home and discovered a cavalcade of horrors. In a closet, they found a human skull as well as human vertebra. In the backyard, they discovered another human head buried in the ground, partially decomposed. In the basement, they found large barrels stained with blood, as well as the personal belongings of two missing people and a stack of Polaroid photos depicting men being sexually assaulted and tortured. They also found a stenographer's pad meticulously detailing the abduction, torture, and murder of six young men from around the area. Robert Bedella was quickly arrested and charged with the murders of six men. He accepted a deal where he pleaded guilty and revealed everything about the vile murders in exchange for life without parole, so avoiding the death penalty. He died of a heart attack while incarcerated at the Missouri State Penitentiary on October 8, 1992, at the age of 43. So ended the life of the Kansas City Butcher one of the most horrific serial killers in modern history. The Vela Incident 
the Vela satellite, which is designed and used for spotting nuclear tests, picked up a telltale double flash on the 22nd of November 1979. The flare of light bounced off Antarctica near to the Prince Edward Islands and would signify that a 2.3 kiloton nuclear bomb had been detonated. But there has never been an official report as to what caused the incident, and the people charged with investigating the explosion insist that it was a malfunction in the equipment rather than a detonation. Any information about the event remains classified by the US government. A possible reason for the flash has been suggested that the signal could have been caused by a meteor hitting the satellite, although all of the previous 41 double flashes recorded by Velas were definitely made by nuclear weapon tests, causing most researchers today to agree that the flash was made by a nuclear test carried out jointly by Israel and South Africa. The Stalking of Bill and Dorothy Wacker Bill and Dorothy were an elderly couple who led a quiet life in the small town of Massillon, Ohio. One day in 1984, they came home to find the house that they had lived in peacefully for 48 years ransacked. This happened again shortly after, and a third time, with police unable to find the culprit. The campaign of terror had begun. Dorothy was attacked from behind and tied up in her home on two occasions. Random items were stolen and strange notes were left around the property. The couple received frightening phone calls at all hours of the day and night. Sometimes there was silence, other times heavy breathing, and the worst calls were those with swearing and threats. The whackers changed their numbers several times, but still the callers kept coming. The stolen items started to reappear on the doorstep one by one. The harassment continued until the couple died within a year of each other in 2010 and the mystery of their stalker has never been solved. I don't like Mondays. Brenda Ann Spencer lived in San Carlo, in the San Carlo neighborhood of San Diego, California, in a house across the street from Grover Cleveland Elementary School. For a 16 year old, she had a pretty miserable existence. She lived in virtual poverty with her alcoholic father after her parents split up and they slept on a single mattress on the living room floor. Despite it being known that Brenda struggled with her mental health and had suicidal thoughts, in 1978, her father brought her a gun for Christmas, a Ruger 10-22 semi-automatic .22 caliber rifle with a telescopic sight and 500 rounds of ammunition. Brenda later said, I asked for a radio and he bought me a gun. When asked why he might have done that, she answered, I felt like he wanted me to kill myself. On the morning of Monday, January 29th, 1979, Spencer began shooting randomly from her home at children who were waiting outside of Cleveland Elementary School while they waited for Principal Burton Rag to open the gates. Eight children were shot. Burton Rag, who was trying to help the children escape, was fatally wounded, along with custodian Mike Susher, who went to Rag's aid. A police officer was also injured during the incident. After firing 30 rounds of ammunition, Brenda barricaded herself in her home for nearly seven hours. During this time, she spoke to a journalist on the telephone who asked why she had done it. Her reply was, I don't like Mondays. After threatening to leave the house shooting, Brenda eventually surrendered. Brenda was tried as an adult and pled guilty to two counts of murder and assault with a deadly weapon and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. As of 2022, she remains incarcerated at the California Institution for Women. Despite repeated parole hearings, she has been successful in securing her release. The shootings were the inspiration for the song, I Don't Like Mondays, written by Bob Geldof, for his band, The Boomtown Rats. Blissfully Unaware in 2004, tourists have traveled from all over the world to escape the winter chill and spend Christmas on the sun-soaked beaches of Thailand. On Boxing Day, at 7.59 a.m., a huge 9.1 magnitude earthquake hit an undersea fault in the Indian Ocean, where two tectonic plates meet. It caused a massive column of water to be propelled towards the shores of Sumatra and Thailand with 500 mile per hour waves. But is this photograph that is the most chilling as curious holiday makers went to play out on the beach and wondered why the waters were oddly receding, completely oblivious to their imminent deaths. 
Despite there being a delay of hours between the earthquake and the impact of the tsunami, everyone was taken by surprise. There were no early warning systems in the Indian Ocean that could have forewarned anyone living in the area. In just a few hours, 230,000 people were dead, making the Boxing Day tsunami the deadliest in recorded history. The Possession of Maria Tallarico The body of Giuseppe Pepe Veraldi was found under a bridge in Catanzaro, Italy in 1936. Police believed he had committed suicide, although his family disagreed. A teenager named Maria was walking under the bridge three years later when she collapsed and was carried home. When she woke, she spoke in a low, guttural voice and said her name was Pepe and demanded to speak to Giuseppe's mother. When Mrs. Veraldi arrived, she was amazed to hear Maria speak in her son's voice. Pepe said that his friends had beaten him to death and tossed him from the bridge into the water below. Mrs. Veraldi insisted that Pepe should stop possessing the poor girl immediately and Maria awoke with no memory of the night's events. Nine years later, Mrs. Veraldi received a letter from one of her son's friends confessing that he had killed Pepe in a jealous rage over a woman. He said three other men had helped him. They were the three men that the possessed Maria had named. They were arrested by police and tried for murder. How had Maria known the truth about Pepe's killers? Had she really been possessed by the spirit of a murdered man? What do you think? The Kentucky Meat Shower In 1876, Mrs. Crouch was on her porch making soap when she started to see pieces of meat falling from the sky. Along with her husband, she believed it to be a sign from God. The chunks of red meat measured between two and four inches long and fell in a 50 to 100 yard area of Olympia Springs, Kentucky. Two men who tasted the meat thought that it was either deer or lamb. A local hunter said it was bear meat. A sample was sent to the Newark Scientific Association for analysis and it was identified as lung tissue coming from either a human infant or a horse. Apparently the two have an almost identical structure. Other samples were identified as muscle and cartilage, but the exact type of meat was never discovered. The most popular theory was that vultures were startled into taking flight and regurgitated their food right over the Crouch's house. Nine days later, red corpuscles that had a vegetable appearance fell over the city of London. Killer Driller Not many of us expect our trusted dentist to be a contract killer, but that is exactly what respected dentist Dr. Glennon Engelman was. By day he fixed teeth for money, in his spare time he killed for the same reward. Engelman shot his first victim in 1958 as part of a scheme to collect insurance money. The man was married to Engelman's ex-wife, and together they pocketed his life insurance. The dentist went on to kill at least six more people, although police believe there were many more. Engelman was finally caught in 1980 after he placed a bomb under Sophie Barrera's car after she failed to pay dental fees she owed. Some of his victims were contract killings and others were insurance scams. He had several accomplices to his crimes, including his former wives, although one of his exes eventually helped to lead to his conviction. Engelman spent the rest of his life in prison. He was only convicted of two murders, but confessed to at least seven others. He died in 1999 from diabetes complications. The Glamour Girl Slayer Harvey Glapman was a warped serial killer who murdered women in the 1950s. He attracted them by posing as a photographer and lurking around modeling agencies in LA. He also posted Lonely Heart adverts in newspapers. When he found a hopeful model, he would take them back to his apartment, tie them up and sexually abuse them. After he had murdered them by strangulation, Glapman hid the bodies in the desert. He took photographs right up until the moment that he killed them. He was caught when he attempted to abduct a Lorraine Vigil in 1958. A patrol woman saw them struggling at the side of the road. Lorraine would have been his fourth murder victim. Once arrested, Gladman confessed and led police to a toolbox containing the photos. 
Glatman was executed in the gas chamber of San Quentin in 1959. Borgvadnet Vicarage The old vicarage was built in the village of Borgvadnet in 1876 and is said to be one of the most haunted houses in Sweden. In 1927, chaplain Nils Hedlund reported the first incident when he witnessed his laundry being ripped off the washing line by an invisible presence. In the 30s, another minister saw an old woman appear and disappear in front of him as he followed her. His successor and his wife had many paranormal experiences involving poltergeist activity. A lady who stayed as a guest was awakened to find three women sitting there watching her while she slept. In 1945, the pastor, Eric Lindegren, kept a journal to record the many experiences that he had in the house. He was regularly thrown from his chair and had many other supernatural encounters. The hauntings have continued up until the present day. The vicarage is now run as a restaurant and guest house, where those brave enough can stay the night. We'd love to know if any of you have ever visited, and if so, let us know what it was like. Fat Man This unsettling photograph from 1945 shows physicist Harold Agnew, who worked on the Manhattan Project. He appears to be quite relaxed and is smiling. No one would imagine that he was holding the plutonium core of one of the most devastating weapons in the world. The atomic bomb named Fat Man was detonated over the Japanese city of Nagasaki on August 9th, 1945, and was responsible for 80,000 deaths. Weighing 14 pounds, Fat Man was the second nuclear bomb to be used in wartime. Little Boy was the first five-ton atomic bomb that the US dropped on the city of Hiroshima. Three days after Fat Man was deployed, Japan surrendered to the Allied forces, effectively bringing World War II to an end. The Belanger Sisters Two Canadian sisters, Audrey and Naomi Belanger, aged 20 and 26, were found dead in their hotel room under mysterious circumstances in June 2012. They were staying at the popular Thai resort of Pai Pai, it is known for its beauty and was featured in the movie The Beach, starring Leonardo DiCaprio. The resort is also notorious for its wild nightlife. The sisters were found covered in vomit with their fingernails and toenails tinged with blue. There was no sign of violence or trauma on their bodies. Several other people have died around Southeast Asia since 2009 in similar circumstances. Coincidentally, many of them were women. There has been a great deal of speculation over these deaths. Maybe someone had spiked their drinks. Was it an allergic reaction or some deadly form of food poisoning or even a serial killer? One theory is that they inhaled phosphine gas released by the pesticide DEET. It is known to have been used in Asia to kill bedbugs and for that reason, it could have been sprayed in the girls' rooms. The Hexham Heads in 1971, in the back garden of a Northumberland house in England, two young boys found two very odd carvings of stone heads. Each head was small enough to fit in the palm of a hand, and the heads were a pale green-grey colour, containing quartz crystals. Almost immediately, the family was plagued by poltergeist activity, which was also experienced by the family next door. At one point, they saw the manifestation of a wolf-like man in their home, who seemed to be searching for something. The heads were passed on to archaeologist Dr. Anne Ross. She believed the heads to be Celtic in origin and was visited by the six-foot werewolf herself. Could the wolfman have been a caretaker for the mysterious heads? The Hexham heads were kept at Newcastle University, where more supernatural events were said to occur. They were then passed on to another man and have subsequently disappeared. Salfataro. Just one of a number of volcanoes to the west of Naples in Italy, Salfataro is a popular tourist destination. The volcanic crater floor is said to be a beautiful sight with many mud pools and vents. The last known eruption of the dormant volcano was in 1198, but the shallow crater is still quite hot. 
magma bubbles below the surface, and there are emissions of steam and fumes from the boiling sulfur inside. While in September of 2017, a couple took their two sons to see the attraction. The older boy slipped and fell into a hole as the ground cracked beneath his feet. Desperately trying to help him, his father also fell into the pit, as did his mother, who went to the aid of them both. All three were tragically overcome by fumes and lost consciousness because of the poisonous gas. Only the traumatized younger child, who was seven, escaped to safety and was later reunited with his grandparents. It goes to show not just how beautiful, but how unforgiving and deadly nature can be. Katazina Zawada In November 1998, Katarzyna was studying in Krakow, Poland, when she went missing. In January of 1999, the captain of the Alk was sailing on the Vistula River when he realized that something was wrapped around the tugboat's propeller blades. The object causing the problem looked like a long rubber band. Closer inspection revealed that there was a human ear attached to it. It was the skin of the student, Katarzyna. She had been flayed alive. Even more disturbing was the fact that the skin appeared to have been prepared in such a way that it could be worn as a suit. At first, Vladimir W. was suspected of her murder. He killed his own father and made a macabre mask from the dead man's skin and scalp, but there was no connection of his involvement with Katarzyna's death. It wasn't until the year 2017 that an arrest was made. 52-year-old Robert Janskusi knew the victim, visited her grave, and had a history of harassment towards women. He had previously worked at the Zoology Institute in Krakow, where he had experience in dissection and the preparation of animal skins. He has been detained while more evidence is currently being gathered. The Timothy Treadwell Tape Timothy was a passionate environmentalist and had a strong desire to coexist with nature. He found a bear protection group called Grizzly People and in 2003, he traveled to the Katmai National Park in Alaska with his girlfriend, Amy. Timothy kept diaries, photographed, and filmed footage of his many expeditions. He had previously visited the area and stayed there every summer for 13 years. He was convinced that he could coexist with the native coastal brown bears and believed they were accepting of his presence. The couple was still at the park that autumn in 2003. At that time of year, the bears are particularly aggressive as they try and feed as much as possible before hibernation in the winter months. Well, you can guess what happened. Unfortunately, the couple were attacked by a large male bear. They were both killed and almost completely eaten. The video camera recovered at the site contained six minutes of audio tape of their horrific deaths. The German film director, Werner Herzog, made a documentary about Timothy's life and can be seen speaking to Timothy's friend, Jewel Palavok, and warning her to never listen to the audio footage of the attack. The audio has, and probably never will be released to the public. The Lemp Family Curse German immigrant Adam Lemp brewed fantastic lager and made himself into a millionaire from the sale of it. In 1862, Adam died and his son William continued to run and expand the thriving business. He brought in new technology for refrigeration and bottling, as well as building a magnificent mansion in St. Louis, Missouri, for his wife Julia and family to enjoy. The couple had six children and William's fourth and favorite son, Frederick, was being prepared to take over the reins of the business. But Frederick became very ill and died of heart failure in 1901 at the age of just 28. William was devastated and mourned the loss of his son deeply. When his close friend also died three years later, William committed suicide with a shotgun. The eldest son, Billy, took over running the brewery, but despite producing a non-alcoholic beer in the 1920s, the company was unable to continue through prohibition and Billy shot himself in his office at the family mansion. His sister, Elsa, was also thought to have shot herself, though some believe her death was suspicious. Alsa's marriage was volatile, and it's possible she was murdered. The third son of William Lemp, Charles Lemp, first shot his dog and then himself in 1949. A truly horrible story of one family's tragedy.
La Pasqualita. In March of 1930, a new mannequin appeared in the shop window of Pascuala Esparza's bridal boutique in Mexico, and people began to talk about the model, as it appeared far more lifelike than any shop mannequin should be. Her face was expressive, with rosy cheeks, clear eyes, and thick eyelashes. Her hands were highly detailed, and there are even varicose veins on her legs. But what spooked most of the locals was how much the mannequin looked like the owner's deceased daughter. And just before the figure appeared, Pascuala's daughter had died on her wedding day. She was bitten and poisoned by a black widow spider. Is it possible that her mother, overcome by grief, embalmed her body and placed her in her wedding dress? The shop has changed hands over the years, but every owner has insisted on keeping the model. Many people are convinced that they have seen the mannequin move, and some say they've seen it cry. The Strange Incident at Barcelona Airport In 1976, a couple were about to embark on an Easter holiday. They arrived at the airport with their young daughter and their nanny. The father left his family to go and collect the plane tickets, and on his return, his wife was alone because their nanny had taken their daughter to the restroom. But time passed, the nanny and her ward did not return, and security was alerted. The airport was searched, but no trace of the missing pair could be found. An old lady told the mother that she needed to pray for the return of her daughter, then she vanished into the crowd. Suddenly, the daughter and nanny appeared sitting right next to the couple. When the nanny was asked where they had been, she was incredulous and said they had been sitting there the whole time. The family boarded the plane, but the nanny became frantic mid-flight and had to be restrained. With the holiday abandoned, the family returned home and the nanny was admitted to hospital, where she was heavily sedated. Under the care of clinical hypnotist Francesco Rovati, the nanny claimed that she had heard an unpleasant sounding male voice that had summoned her at the airport. Ravati found that a powerful post-hypnotic block had been put in place, and when he tried to push her beyond that point, the nanny became hysterical. All further investigations were dropped in fear for the nanny's sanity, and no further explanations were ever given. The Pteranodon Photo The Pteranodon was a species of flying reptile belonging to the class of pterosaurs which we recently did a documentary on, over on our Dinosaur Discovery Channel. They lived in some areas of North America during the late Cretaceous period, about 79 million years ago. In these areas of the US, sightings of enormous birds have been reported for over 200 years. They are seen so frequently that the creatures have been nicknamed Thunderbirds, a word taken from the mythology of the Native Americans. During the 1950s, a strange photograph was published which shows some American Civil War soldiers standing around the carcass of an enormous bird. It is said to have been shot down in 1864 near Vicksburg, Mississippi. The photo was published long before the internet and Photoshop were a thing. To complicate matters, another similar photograph appeared which was an obvious fake and undermined the validity of the original. But what do you think of the original? Is it real, or a fake? Salish Seafoot Mystery On the 20th of August 2007, a young girl was visiting Jedediah Island, British Columbia in Canada, when she came across a blue and white size 12 Adidas running shoe containing a sock. Inside the sock was a man's right foot. But that macabre find was just the start. As of January 1st, 2019, another 20 feet have been found washed up on the coasts of either British Columbia or Washington State. And it also happened way back in 1887, when a foot was found on the shores of Vancouver. The place where it was discovered was named Leg in Boot Square, and in 1914, a leg was found inside a boot at the mouth of the Salmon River. Today, there has been a great deal of speculation as to the origin of the Salish Seafoot, Ocean currents can carry items over tremendous distances. A human foot could float as far as a thousand miles. Victims of plane crashes or boating accidents have been put forward as reasons for the fines. Other theories include people who died in the 2004 Asian tsunami or a serial killer as being responsible.
Plum Island. Situated off the coast of Long Island, New York, Plum Island is just three miles long and one mile wide. It is owned by the US government and has been the subject of many conspiracy theories. The island was bought in 1659 by the governor of Connecticut from the Wyandak, the local ruling native chieftain of Long Island. The price was 100 fish hooks, a coat and a barrel of biscuits. It was owned by more than 20 families before being bought by the government in 1899 for $90,000. In 1954, the Department of Agriculture created the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. Studies held there were said to be for the benefit of ranchers, farmers and national food supply. Because of the nature of the research, access to the island is strictly off limits. The Department of Homeland Security took over all facilities in 2003. The conspiracy theories have probably emerged because the place is shrouded in so much secrecy and several strange creatures have washed up on the shores around the island over the years, like the famous Montauk Monster. Are these creatures failed animal experiments that the government does not want us to know that are currently being held on Plum Island? What do you think? The Miracle of the Sun In May of 1917, three Portuguese peasant children were tending to their family's flock of sheep, when apparently the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to them three times. The apparition frequently returned to the children over the next few months. On one of the appearances, she told the children a secret in three parts and said that she will provide a miracle at noon on the 13th of October so that everyone will believe in her. Up to 100,000 people gathered in the Cova de Ira fields of Fatima in Portugal to witness the events. According to observers, after some rainfall, the dark clouds parted and the ground became immediately dry. The sun appeared to be zigzagging and dancing about in the sky. There were brilliant lights that cast multicolored rays across the people and the landscape. The miracle of the sun was declared to be of supernatural character worthy of belief by the church. The Falling Soldier This photograph was taken by Robert Kappa on September 5th, 1936, at the beginning of the Spanish Civil War. It made the 25-year-old Kappa famous, and he was named the greatest war photographer in the world. But the image has created a great deal of speculation. It was thought to show the death of a Republican soldier, but the man was later thought to be an anarchist, militia man named Federico Barral Garcia. Many claim that the photograph was staged and not caught during fighting, as Kappa claimed. According to some, the landscape doesn't fit with the narrative that it was taken at the battle site of Cerro Morano and was taken 30 miles away in Espajo, miles away from any fighting. We'd need to do a deep dive on this one, but love to hear your thoughts. The Akka de Sawa Voodoo Fetish Market in a place where practitioners of the voodoo religion can find anything that they could possibly want. The market is held every day in Lom, the capital city of Togo. Although voodoo is usually associated with the Caribbean country of Haiti, it was derived from the religion, followed in several West African countries. The market is an open-air pharmacy full of macabre ingredients that can be used in voodoo healing. There are dead cobras, chimpanzee hands, crocodile heads, hyena skulls, and other animals in all various stages of decay, all piled up in scary looking displays. For practitioners of voodoo, every animal, whether alive or dead, is considered divine and powerful. These animal parts can be used in talismans, or ground up and mixed with herbs for use in powders for medicines. There are charms for everything, from infertility to curing a cold, or even removing a curse. For the unaccustomed, the smell is said to be overwhelming. Lake Pinya Disaster In 1980, on the morning of the 21st November, a team of Texaco oil riggers were drilling on the lake when the drill seized up. When trying to free the device, there were a series of loud popping noises and the platform began to tilt towards the water. Alarmed, the seven-man crew quickly got off the platform and scrambled to the shore. It took just one and a half hours for the 150-foot-high rig to disappear below the water. 
It was astonishing, as the lake had an average depth of only three feet. Unknowingly, the men had drilled into the main shaft of the diamond crystal salt mine. Its tunnels ran beneath the rock under the lake. Lake water gushed into the mine, but luckily all 55 miners were able to escape, as everything was sucked into the largest man-made whirlpool in history. A tugboat, a parking lot, a dock, and a chunk of nearby island all got sucked into the void. Now the lake is filled with brackish water because of the salt mine, and the once three foot deep freshwater lake is now the deepest lake in Louisiana with a depth of 200 feet. The Mystery Man of Nova Scotia In September 1863, a young boy made a shocking discovery on the beach of Digby Neck. He found a young man with no legs, semi-conscious on the sand. The stranger was terrified when the townsman tried to help him and tried to crawl back towards the sea. Soaking wet, he was finally taken to the home of the Albrights. He slowly recuperated, but remained ill-humoured and only uttered a few incoherent words. One of those words was interpreted as Jerome, and the name stuck. The wounds from his amputated legs were completely healed long before he was found. No one knew who he was, and Jerome either wouldn't or couldn't say. It turned out that he'd been found earlier in Chipman, New Brunswick. He was dying in the woods from hypothermia after falling into the icy river, his legs badly frostbitten. The local surgeon had to amputate them, and the man became a disliked member of the community because of his sullen personality. He was supposed to be shipped off to Liverpool, but ended up being dumped in Nova Scotia instead. Despite having this additional information, the identity of Jerome remains a mystery. No one ever knew where he really came from, or why he was in New Brunswick. UFOs that burn. For the humans that claim to have encountered UFOs, most of the sightings are painless but sometimes people have been known to get hurt. In 1980, Vicky Landrum, 57, and her grandson Colby, who was seven, were returning home to Dayton, Texas with Vicky's friend Betty Cash. The trio noticed a glowing object in the sky. It was a massive blue diamond hovering with huge red flames shooting down to the road. Betty got out of the car and went to take a look. She felt her eyes beginning to burn, but couldn't turn away and the UFO held all three of them there, entranced for 15 minutes. Once they got home, they all began to be sick. Their skin turned bright red, and their eyes began to weep and burn. Betty found large lumps forming on her body. She had an excruciating headache, and her hair began to fall out. Vicky also suffered similarly, and had to be admitted to hospital. Her skin peeled off like that of a burns victim, and there were blisters all over her body. During hypnosis by a professor from Wyoming University, Vicky was found to be a reliable witness. Further testing revealed that all three witnesses were suffering from radiation poisoning. The Pennsylvania Dutch Hex Murder In the 1920s, Hex Holloway, York County, Pennsylvania was the home of Nelson Raymer, Powwowing was still practiced in the area by the Pennsylvania Dutch. This form of folk magic had grown from the 1820 book The Long Lost Friend by German writer John George Hohmann. The book contained a collection of remedies, spells, and talismans to cure illness and lift misfortune. After being translated into English, it was renamed Powwows. John Blymer was advised by Nellie Knoll, the local witch, to get a lock of Nelson's hair and burn his copy of the book. Nelly said it was the only way that John's curse could be lifted. He was obsessed with hexes, and had even spent time in an insane asylum for treatment. But when John broke into Nelson's home with his accomplice, he couldn't find the book, and Nelson was killed in the struggle. Although Nelson was doused in petrol and set on fire, mysteriously the flames went out, meaning that the perpetrators were soon caught and sentenced to life imprisonment. Oya Verde. On the 5th of February 1923, the boat from the neighboring town of Hoya Verde, Brazil, was due to arrive carrying its usual daily shipment of trading goods, but it never arrived. 
the villagers decided to go out and find what was the problem. At arrival at Hoya Verde Dock, they were struck by how quiet and eerie things were. The trading boat stood fully laden, still tied down. On venturing further into the town, the mystery deepened. All the houses were empty, and everyone had just vanished. An investigation was begun by the police, which led them to the school. A gun was found on the ground outside, that had been recently fired. And on a chalkboard in the school, the phrase, There is no salvation was written. Many theories have been debated over the years. Had the citizens been evacuated because of guerrilla warfare? Had they left in fear of something supernatural, or were they abducted by aliens? The podcaster, Hector Navarro, believes that he has found the solution to the mystery. He traced the origins of the story back through several websites, until he eventually came across an article from the Russian newspaper Pravda. Dated April 2004, the piece is titled, Black Holes Devour People. It discusses Hoya Verde, as well as other mass disappearances. Navarro claims that 95% of the information in the article is untrue. According to him, residents of Hoya Verde never disappeared because they never existed. But there are always going to be people who ask the question, where did they get the information for this article in the first place? And what really happened to the residents of Hoya Verde?